It is March the 13th of 2024. I'm Nick, here with Quinn. Uh, how are you doing today? I'm doing good, Nick. How about yourself? I'm trying to keep it kind of low-key beginning here. I'm doing all right myself. I hope all you all are doing good out there as well. Uh, I think that normally at this point we would kind of like immediately go off on a tangent and we will be doing that <laughs> yeah i'm like nick uh we're not, gonna, we're not gonna be like all somber and stuff during the whole show nick but... uh what's uh <laughs> well you said an orange right remember like orange yeah, juice we're, we're, uh was we're... that your favorite juice orange cassidy nick boom wrestling we're there <laughs> just <laughs> started... <laughs> that's just where an association you play with yourself yes uh, <laughs> i um... jeff gold blew myself before we uh, get into all the usual stuff, because we do, first and foremost, you know, when something bad happens, I think that one of the main things that we can do by doing the show is just have a good time and kind of try and share that good time with everyone out there who likes listening to us. And we are going to do that. Um, but I think that uh, we can't really put off saying this, that this is the first episode that we are recording and streaming uh, since the news broke that Akira Toriyama passed. Mm -hmm. And uh, Akira Toriyama, of course, the creator of Dragon Ball, which is arguably the most important manga anime ever. Um, and uh, certainly, you know, played a huge role in making it popular uh, in English-speaking parts of the world. And uh, without it, I mean, there's probably a lot of stuff that would be different just in terms of stuff that has been imported over and hasn't been, uh, the expectations a lot of people have over it, uh, and all of the different things that it influenced. Uh, chances are not only like if, uh, not only is you know, your favorite series, if it's come out in the last 40 years, not only are chances high that it was probably influenced by Dragon Ball in some way, but uh, a reason that you have heard of it is probably related to Dragon Ball. Um, and uh, a lot of things that we do, communities that exist made around discussing and sharing a love of this medium are partially in part because of Dragon Ball's popularity when it came over to uh, English-speaking parts of the world 30 years ago. And so without that, uh, things would be very different for a lot of us. Uh, even if, you know, you're not like the biggest Dragon Ball fan in the world. Uh, like it, it's undeniable like how big a part it has played in all of us doing a lot of things. So, uh, thank you, Toriyama, for that. Uh, it's kind of impossible to quantify how much we owe that. Yeah, uh, I, I agree completely. Um, I will say that uh, I don't know. Toriyama personally so you know a huge condolences to his children his family uh those who knew and love him everyone who I've seen uh speak about him have only ever spoke about uh an incredible person so you know a ton of um you know uh condolences to anybody who's just lost an important part of their lives um speaking to somebody who who definitely has been massively influenced by Dragon Ball uh I had like sort of a, a weird reaction to all of this uh in that i really just thought of toriyama's legacy which we brought up you know uh dragon ball obviously is the big thing but he's done plenty of other manga we read sandman on this show dr slump is another huge one uh we even discussed uh jocko, jocko. galacto patrolman mm -hmm. uh but it's also worth noting he was the artist for all the characters in Chrono Trigger, yeah. which is one of the most iconic role-playing games from kind of our generation, I guess. Right, uh, right. He is the artist for the Dragon Quest uh, characters. He designed the slime, which is one of the more iconic, like sort of uh, video game mascots. Uh, even Blue Dragon, another video game, not, not in like that same tier, yeah, but yeah. like another thing that he, he is the artist for. And that's like an incredible pedigree of uh, reach um as 
I think to an artist, I, I don't want to speak universally, but I, I think two of the things when you create art, when you create art, you generally want to do is you want to entertain a lot of people. You want to amuse people. You want to you want to connect with people, um, and then you want to maybe inspire others to create their own art. Um, to the first point, I'll say uh, Toriyama has accomplished something that very very few figures in the world have ever done, which is create a global presence. This isn't like Dragon Ball, like escape Japan. It became a big thing in a couple countries. Like I feel like most countries in the world, if you go there, there are t-shirts selling bootleg uh, t-shirts of, of Goku on it. Like this is like, he's everywhere, you know? Right. Um, that's sort of like a pervasiveness that is unheard of really. There's, there's really only a few cultural things that same way that like, uh, you know, you, you can show a picture of Superman or Batman to people across the world and they'll be able to identify. You can do the same thing with Goku, which is incredible. And to the second point, basically every mangaka that we kind of cover in our show, which is very shonen battle inspired, uh, will cite Dragon Ball as an influence. Uh, you know, Oda and Kishimoto have directly come out and said, you know, they were like, we were good friends. Like, we were, you know, huge, uh, hugely inspired by Toriyama, and I think pretty much every contemporary around there would also agree. I haven't read every comment that's been said from people, but, uh, you know, basically I think everyone in that generation considers Dragon Ball an influence point. And, like, even new mangaka now and this new generation we're getting are all saying, like, yeah, Dragon Ball's <laughs> kind of one of the big ones. So it's, you know, this incredible thing um, that, in a way, I don't feel a lot of sadness for, because it's it's one of those sort of awe-inspiring things, you know. This isn't Van Gogh who didn't get to see himself, you know, be appreciated. Uh, Akira Tariyama, sixty-eight, is still young, um, but he got to experience all of, you know, his series blowing up all over the world and becoming this huge thing, and seeing all of these people inspired by him take their things and go on to become huge successes and then inspire their own. And I think that is an absolutely wonderful and beautiful thing. So I, uh, I am sad that he is, he is no longer with us. And again, condolences to his family, but that, I, I don't think life is a contest, but if, if it was, he, he definitely won. Hmm. There was a, I remember a video game came out uh, several years ago. I think it was like the Dragon Ball, uh, the Dragon Ball Kakarot or Dragon Ball Goku. The yeah. One Kakarot. Uh, and one of the ways that they marketed it was just by showing a little kid playing the game and then an adult playing the same game. And as they're doing it, they both get hyped up and do the Kamehameha motion because that is such a big thing that everyone just loves to do. Yeah. Uh, it's that it, joy from uh, something that, at this point, like a lot of us have had with us for most of our lives. Yeah. Uh, and that is incredible that something has caused so much happiness for so many people. And yeah, I mean, it's not even just Dragon Ball, like you said. Everything else that he did, the number of people that he worked with and inspired, and just truly incredible. And yeah, I, I kind of felt the same in a way that you said, where it, I didn't feel like, oh, this sucks, this is so sad, uh, because he definitely seemed to do anything you could want to do and more uh, mm -hmm. in the career that he had, and I'm happy that he did. Yeah, he made a lot of people happy, and that's, yeah. I think, all all we could shoot for. So, uh, rest in peace, Akira Toriyama. Uh, your work and legacy will continue, and uh, in a way, you know, you're still here. We're, we're still going to be, we're still going to be imitating Kamehamehas. We're still going to be pretending to go Super Saiyan, like pretending. <laughs> well, I don't want to give it away. I don't, I don't want to uh, give the game away. <laughs> yeah, right. We don't want to. We don't want to. We don't want to show off our true forms just yet. <laughs> yeah. uh, I have to wait till my opponent is at their weakest, and then they'll power up, and then I'll power up in response. Yeah. Yeah, got to fool their scouters. All right, everybody. We do have other manga to talk about today. Uh, and to begin with, uh, we took a recommendation a couple of weeks ago. 
this was a recommendation that uh, you you uh, had us do, Quinn. Yes. Uh, called Marriage Toxin. Mm-hmm. One word. Oh yeah, it, that was kind of the thing that that got me a couple of times when I was like trying to Google it. it was like I was oh it's all one word. How weird. <laughs> And also but... stylized in all capital letters on the Manga Plus site. So mm. it's very interesting to try to figure out. I'm going with just the capital M uh, for like the coordination of posting this episode right. and titling it. But I do but think word. it is still one word. But uh, yeah, it is, it is also all capital letters on Manga Plus. Yeah, the Google, the Google algorithms might not uh, get, get us on that one if we don't put it in all caps. <laughs> Uh, by Jom Yakyo and Mizuki Yoda. Uh, and uh, this is a series in which our main character, Gero, is an assassin. He is an assassin from actually like a clan of assassins called the Poison Clan. He is due to like inherit the head of this clan. Uh, as by their name, he specializes in using poisons. Uh, although in much more flexible ways than you would think uh just from just from that this this this, uh, this reaches a level of um coco from torico levels of it, like it, it, i use this poison to accomplish this thing you're like i sure all right i mean it's I kind used, of sounds like medicine at this point but sure i used this poison to kick you in the head yeah all right, well. <laughs> fair enough uh Gero is supposed to get married and have a child in order to continue on the lineage of his clan. This has not been a priority for him for a while. Uh, but then uh, he is told that his younger sister uh, is going to have to get married and have a kid. and She doesn't want to do that because she's already in a relationship with another woman. Uh, so he decides that maybe he should do something about that. And then it becomes much more of a personal thing for him. He decides, you know what, I actually really do want to have a family. I want to find someone special for me and get married. And he has this epiphany in the middle of a job that he's doing where he has been tasked with, um, let's just call it executing uh, <laughs> someone that's been captured, uh, Kinosaki. Um, because he's an assassin, but like they've already captured Kinosaki. So, <laughs> um, so Garo sees Kinosaki, who... Uh, is this very attractive uh, person and just kind of has this idea of like, well, I'll tell you what, what if instead of like me killing you, we could just get married? Uh, and Kinosaki turns him down because uh, no, uh, that would probably not be a good idea. Uh, and instead proposes, uh, has, a, has a counter proposal, which is that Kinosaki will help Gero to find his proper match. Uh, because Kinosaki is a marriage swindler. In fact, that's what they were captured for, was by marrying a boss and then, you know, like, ripping him off for a bunch of money. Uh, so Gero agrees to this plan, saves Kinosaki. Turns out that Kinosaki, by the way, who often dresses as a woman, is uh, a man who tends to cross-dress. Uh, this is a thing that I was that I was paying attention to, and it seems as though the official story is that Kinosaki is just a man but yeah. tends to dress as both genders quite often, especially mm. dresses as frequently as a woman. They, they, uh, he very specifically dresses as both genders to fool anybody <laughs> out of marriage, yes. if need be. Um, so. Yes. I'll marry you, I'll marry, or I'll switch, I'll switch into uh, the other gender guys, and then I'll marry you if you're into that, that kind yeah. of thing. Um, so these two decide to work together uh, and form this partnership, uh, where Kinosaki, who is an expert on romance and human relationships and stuff, is helping out Gera, who is an expert on killing and basically nothing else, to try and find the right match for him. Uh, and that is our story, uh, is him trying to find the right woman uh, while also performing assassination jobs. <laughs> and in fact, doing them at the same time. Almost every job they takes is with the cycle of maybe I can, you know, date this woman that I'm working for or trying I, to protect. I, I want to I want to note cuz the way that sounds could be very easily interpreted as like, oh, this is a revolting human being. <laughs> He's like, I'll save you so we can date. It is very clear he he has noble intentions with all this that he is trying mm -hmm. to find uh, a a female partner. Um but he will oftentimes do these missions despite that fact because he is more interested in doing the right thing. That is that is a 
a large part of what the story starts to unfold about Garrow's character is although he is an assassin with these incredible poison related skills he ultimately feels very unfulfilled and empty in his heart because he wishes he could be using those skills to do good things to help people mm -hmm. so i do want to make it clear in case you're listening you have no idea what the series is you're like well that sounds awful uh it is not bad he is doing this for good reason i think also we we didn't mention that part of the reason why he has chosen now to start looking for a partner is because his sister who is uh, a lesbian uh mm -hmm. is going to be forced to marry a man and start having children if he's not going to find somebody right so to be very clear, he he everything he is doing it is to try to help the people around him, uh, and oftentimes the mission he's he's taking on aren't even like I'm going to date them. That's kind of more about what um, that's uh, Kinosaki's, Kinosaki's pushing, yeah. and he's more like, well, I'll just meet some people, <laughs> right? Um, and yeah, it, it starts off with that and. I was kind of expecting that things would get into the realm of like, oh, assassin comedy stuff because, God, we've gotten a lot of those lately. Uh, <laughs> Nick, Nick's sitting there like, oh, is this going to be another oh one of God. those Sakamoto days? Is it going to be another Code Blue? Is it going to be, uh, what was what was it, the Hitman House Husband? Uh, oh, one? Way of the House Husband, yeah. Way of the House Husband, is it going to be one of those? And it's actually way more action oriented than i was expecting this, this, this is, is straight up a battle series this is a battle series uh it's just got the framing device of garrow's long-term goal is to hopefully beat the right person for him romantically uh so um we kind of follow he him on this series of missions that he takes on which uh are not kind of atypical for just typical assassination work it's you know he's trying to rescue this woman who uh steals art from uh illegal uh, art traders or he's trying to protect this girl who is due to inherit a company from her recently passed father uh and kinosaki goes along with him even though he has no skills associated with going on these dangerous missions but has to be there in those cases where Garrow is going to interact with uh, a potential love match so that he can tell Garrow what to say and what to look out for because he's helpless in that department without yes. help. At first, at least. Uh, it is also like an ongoing thing between them where Kinosaki will be like, let's go and practice like skills like that you would want to have on a date. Yeah. Like you'll want to be able to like, do good at arcade games to impress a girl you would go on a date with. So let's go to the arcade and practice there. That kind of thing. Uh, so that's the series. Um, it's good. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I want to I wanna talk about this because I, I fully <laughs> expected... Um, I don't know what I expected, I guess. But I, I wasn't expecting to enjoy it as much as I did. Um, especially based off the first couple chapters. Like, it's fine. Like, the first couple chapters gets us into a tone, and, like, you know, there's emotion, stuff like that. Um, but once, like, we start the first, like, arc, um, the series, one, is very, very heartwarming. Because Garrow is a very, very sweet man. Uh, like, he goes through all of this effort to try to, uh, you know, like, meet and, and find a significant other. And then, like, when he's done everything right, like, they're putty in his hands, he's like, let's be friends. <laughs> like, he's like, a, like, he's like, we don't really know each other yet. Let's, let's, let's take this slow. And there's actually a thing um, that, like, in between chapters, sometimes we'll get small text message mm -hmm. conversations with some of the girls uh, showing, like, hey let's go do this date like and then the color page go on a date. will be yeah. the date and it's like genuinely very very sweet um but the thing that really threw me for a loop is how fucking wild this series gets so quickly at the start i was yeah. like okay he's got his wacky poisons and he'll fight other like he eventually runs into somebody else who also has powers i'm like yep yeah, i get it i get it then they finish the art uh, mission. They're like, well, let's get out of here. And they're like, well, how are we going to get out of here? And the, the, the side character's like, we'll just ride my part, my pet shark. <laughs> and you're like... And it's not it's not like a thing. This is this woman is just... She's just an art thief. Yeah. Like, she repossesses art for people and stuff. 
and it turns out she's obsessed with sharks. She loves she has sharks. A shark, she has a shark mount. They go on a hangout thing that turns into a one-on-one -on -one date because, you know, uh, uh, he was, uh, Kinosaki, Kinosaki pretends uh, to not be able to make it. Yeah, like, and so they go to a shark club. Yeah. They wear all, <laughs> Everyone wears shark, shark hats. <laughs> also, when they're, she sends emojis, they're exclusively they're all shark sharks. based. <laughs> It's... And they have puns. They have puns on them. Like I see what you did there. It's. <laughs> it's. I was like, I love the the second that happened. The second she showed up, she's like, Yeah, let's ride away on my pet shark. I was like, All right, I'm in. I like the, the. You already were kind of winning me over, but this is exactly the kind of absurdity that I love, because <laughs> it's it. There is no real basis or anything to it there's just insanity and i i love that so much um but this series is also very grounded i would say in terms of like an emotional ground emotions yeah uh because you know they have a conversation it's clear like there is a connection that has happened between yeah. them they've been through all the adrenaline of you know gero has saved her life uh with some prodding from kinosaki he starts to actually make a real genuine connection with her he talks about you know, because they're at a restaurant and he doesn't feel comfortable eating food uh, there because he's been trained since birth not to eat food that's prepared by someone else because he's a poison user. Yeah. It could have been poisoned with something. So he, he doesn't ever feel comfortable with that. Uh, but he opens up to, to her about that and she shares something about it herself as well. And they realize there's this like spark between them where they get each other. And then Gero drops that line of like, I want to be friends with you. Can we be friends? And it's like, oh, come on, dude. What are you, what are you thinking? But then he explains himself, and he's like, you seem like a really good person, and I just want, like, to be friends with you. And she's like, what, don't you want to ask me how to date? And he's like, yeah, I do, but I want us to have that permanent connection first because it seems like, you know, you need someone and I need someone, and we, it feels like we would be really good for each other as friends. And then... It does turn romantic. Yeah. Great. Uh, this this is, out... this this is not quite a hundred girlfriends who really really like you. Where he's like, I have a giant polycule of girlfriends. Everyone is very clearly like, I don't know. Maybe we'll go on a couple dates and and yeah, and see. Um, and there is this like I Shield twenty one style thing where at the end of each mission, like it shows his friend counter. Yeah. he's added them as a contact, and it's. Honestly, genuinely sweet because it starts off as it's just Kinosaki. That's the only other person. That and like, really. uh, the oh, bug and guy. The, the bug user. Yeah. We'll talk about him. Uh, <laughs> we have a lot to talk about him. Uh, um, so it starts off as like it's it's just one and then it becomes two with Kinosaki. And then each girl gets that and is like, oh, three friends. Oh, four friends. And yeah. each time is like, oh, he's got another friend. It's so great. You know, the, someone that, you know, he gets along with and, and everything like that. It seemed like I was, despite this theme each time, like, oh, it looks like there might, he might date this girl and said, like, oh, let's be friends first because, you know, there's a girl who's going to inherit a company. And he's like, you, I feel like, you know, aren't ready for this kind of thing. And she's like, yeah, I want to figure out who I am first kind of thing. <laughs> okay, that makes sense. But then there is a girl that uh, has, like, idolized him mm -hmm. since she was, like, 12. Because uh, he saved her life. She's also part of an assassin clan, although it's a different assassin clan. She's part of the beast clan, and she she, she specializes in hamsters. She is the hamster uh, she, user, yeah. She's the hamster user. Um, and she's got, like, this real feeling of, like, inadequacy, because, like, she's not a strong person. She can use hamsters to do, like, spying and stuff, and she can use them for all sorts of weird tricks, basically. Uh, so if you want to have a you know a good party time and stuff, she's there. She she's great, but she can't like, she can't just kill you with hamsters basically. Yeah. Um, so because he had saved her at one point, she idolizes him. She's got a massive crush on him, and then he ends up saving her life again after this big long adventure that they have, and she confesses to him at the end of everything. She's like, "I like you, you know. I I yeah. I I really like you." But I'm not ready to date you yet. Yes. And it's like, well, why is that? And she's like, if we, if you return my feelings, and she's like, and it would be like, you know, I would feel over the moon if that happened. 
but if you return my feelings, we started going out. I would be dependent on you. I need. She's to, like, I gotta work on myself. I gotta work on myself, and then once I'm ready, I hope you'll hear out. I'll, I'll be ready to confess to you again. And so, you know, you better watch out because I'm gonna be awesome, and then you'll, I'll make you fall in love with me, basically. Yes. So, it's the thing that you see a lot of in you know romantic comedy things of like, oh, and they don't get together yet. But every single time that it happens, it comes from this understanding that a character has been through something that has made them realize that they need something to happen and that thing that needs to happen is not a relationship so mm -hmm. they prioritize something else and so in a way it's happy that they're not getting into a relationship because there's this feeling like okay this person's going to be better off and it's not like they're going to just never see each other again because you see that evidence from those little snippets between chapters like oh they're still occasionally seeing each other yeah. they're getting they're getting to go on these just these casual little things together and stuff and maybe something will come of that uh so it's really weird i i had the thought about 20 chapters or so into this especially when I started introducing the concept of like the different clans and stuff and how there's like five major clans and everything it was like so we've got, you know, for people who grew up with Naruto, there's Boruto now. <laughs> and for people who grew up with Naruto and then want Naruto to have grown up with them, there's kind of this series. Because <laughs> it is crazy. The action in this is stupid insane. Yeah. It is basically shown in battle scenes with absurd, over-the-top abilities by supposed assassins who don't act like assassins they act like superheroes uh in terms of how they fight there, there are there are characters. situations where characters will, uh, will uh, there's a there's a water using character who mm -hmm. reveals as long as uh, the water is touching her skin she can control it <laughs> and you're like yes well excuse me you just shut <laughs> this up. is just magic <laughs> okay all right yeah, over there. she can do it yeah. <laughs> um but Instead of, you know, having that idea of like, oh, you know, there's this like huge goal that I want to accomplish and stuff. It's like, I want to freaking have a family and you know? yeah. <laughs> I want to have someone that I can like spend the rest of my life with and be happy, uh, which is such a much more like grounded thing um, than like, oh, I want everyone in the world to acknowledge me or, or yeah. what have you. I want, I want to be king of the pirates or any, anything like that. So it's this weird like. It's, it is like a shodan battle thing for adults and not in that way of like, oh, everyone swears and there's blood and guts and stuff. It's like, no, there's just like a different, yeah. this is adults he's, doing the shodan battle thing. He's a, a, I don't want to say older. I don't even know if I know exactly he's what like his age is, but like mid twenties, but he's somebody, as you said, he is, he is aiming to settle down. He is aiming to look at real romance. Uh, and I think one of the, the series strengths is just how earnestly he is about everything. He really does, like, like it's a joke that he can't talk to women and he's just kind of nervous mm -hmm. sometimes. And sometimes he thinks he's doing something cool and everyone around him is like, actually, this is deeply uncool. Um, but there are times where he just speaks 100% authentically with his heart. And those are like the best moments in the series. Characters in this are so willing to be like completely earnest with their thoughts. And it's like, I'm not going to lie. I cried multiple times reading this Aww. series. Because there are several points where characters will just say something I'm like, that's such a fucking beautiful sentiment. Holy shit. Um, and I like that his, I don't want to say partners, I guess uh, friends, we'll say. Uh, potentially like get their own place i was worried at the start that all of these girls would end up just being damsels quite a few of them end up having to be someone he has to rescue but then right. they usually put something in there to be like hey this character is going to do something to stand on her own two feet and push herself forward i think pretty much every girl has that moment they're allowed to have their own agency and and you know kind of b characters and one of my favorites was uh shiori who's a pretty early character mm -hmm. but she's like this nervous girl um she's, such, she's just like this wilting she's always hiding in her hoodie she, kind of yeah girl. and and she's just so socially awkward like she mm -hmm. she wants to be more social but she just doesn't know how and for a large part i was like this is a fine archetype but i would expect more of this and like 
a harem or something like i don't know if this is like the vibe like after the last girl who was the shark girl i was yeah. like i don't know if another girl's really going to compete with this like that's a high bar and then uh you know they wrap up her story and it's kind of neatly tied down and any like the main characters like actually i'm not going to ask her to be my partner because she has she's a ceo now and she has all yeah. these responsibilities so i'm just gonna let her do her own thing and he leaves and she takes a motorcycle and drives it out at the top of a skyscraper yep. and stops him to ask him for his details and i was like all right you got me again they keep finding ways to do it to have one of these ladies just do something where i'm like all right i'm fine you got me again i can't i can't stop it i love shiori she starts off like when in her introductory scene there uh because they tell like the explanation of how they actually took on the job in a flashback so the first time you see her they're hanging out at like uh a welcome party for like freshmen at the college that she's going to and she's you know off in a corner with garrow who's her bodyguard and she's got her hood up and yeah. stuff but then she sees that a toast is happening over in another side of the room so she like crawls over a little bit closer and like from like 15 feet away from the group she also participates Aww. in the toast and then yeah. she crawls back she's like she's so shy but yeah. she wants to be part of it and garo is always telling her like oh you don't have to do this stuff if you don't want she's like i want to do it though she's just she wants to she... do these things but she's shy and then at the by the end of everything because she's been through this whole ordeal uh where she helps uh yeah. in a big way in putting a stop to the assassin that is after her um like she does like these magic tricks to break brainwashing on people and stuff um she is drawn differently like yeah. you can see how much brighter and more confident she is it is such a satisfying little story arc that she goes on because of this and so absolutely it's like thank god garo came into this girl's life <laughs> yeah. and she's like she's so much happier more confident it's so nice and it like it the repairs her her family organization for a while. It's like, oh, her yeah. aunt is actually trying to kill her. And then in the end, she's able to connect with her aunt. And now their family unit is even stronger than it was before. I will say this is also an optimistic series. Like, I would not for go... about assassins. Yeah. There's a lot of... <laughs> There's like, a lot of, like, what if we help each other? That happens. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and speaking of which... The best character in the manga. So the and the guy who really plays a big influence on Garo, uh, in terms of him deciding that he wants to do this. Uh, oh, is this the artist them. from the artist from Neolation? From Neolation. Holy yeah. shit, that does explain some things. Yeah. Um, the I'm, I'm okay with Neolation dying if it means we got this. I won't say that, but it's, it's very <laughs> good. Uh, his name is Hanamaki, uh, and he is from an insect clan. You know, he specializes in using... He, he's Shino, uh, but he, is, he specializes <laughs> well, in using... Can we but, talk like, about Shino that? Shino got to do stuff... Can we, like, talk, can we talk about this for a second? Did, I don't know if you saw, uh, but it was posted on our Discord. Originally, this manga was going to be about a bug user like shino uh, and the manga was like uh i just don't know if anyone will be, <laughs> be able to fall in love with someone bugs, like right. <laughs> so shino inspired this series which i do not think is a stretch to say that is the most significant and impactful thing that shino has ever done <laughs> in, in any reality uh so there's this insect user named hanamaki who like he's drinking buddies with gero yeah. Uh, and one day Gero learns like, oh, he's getting married and stuff. And he's just marrying this like cute, normal girl that he met on, you know, on an assassination job one day and he ended up saving her and they, they bonded and grew us. And Hanamaki is this big, gruff, gross looking guy. He has a always tattoo. A surgical mask on. He has a tattoo of a centipede going across his face. Like this, yeah. that is, that is a decision. Yeah. And he is the sweetest guy. Yeah. Uh, he, you know, he cares about Garo and what he's going through. There is a guy who tries to ruin his wedding 
because G Hanamaki hugged him. It's like... I again. This is another one of the scenes I kind of cried at. He's, he's just like, how could you ever show me a face? It's just a scene with him at his absolute lowest. And Hanamaki like walked up to him and was like, hey, bud. <laughs> just gave him a big okay. hug. <laughs> You're like, fuck, man. You can't. Come on. Uh, so there's a story arc where Gero and uh, and uh, uh, Kinosaki, I keep forgetting his name, uh, go to his wedding. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, Gero, while he's there, has to stop someone from ruining it and stuff like that. And it's just like, there, you, there's so many parts of it. Like, you see, like, you know, the way, the way that, like, he and his bride look at each other and stuff and how he, like... He summons a giant like moth or butterfly or something to carry him so he can carry him <laughs> through the air. It's, it's not only how he gets into the wedding, it's how he leaves as well. And I was like, Yes. I, I don't know what to, he, I, I, uh, yeah, I'd be all over it too if he was like, Hey, honey, we're going to fly into our wedding on a giant butterfly. I'd be like, I marry, I am marrying the correct person. <laughs> uh, it's, such a weirdly heartwarming series about assassins. Yeah. Um, it's it's very, very unique in that way. And I genuinely enjoy it. Um, I, I was impressed by the battle elements. I do think there's a little roughness, if I'm going to critique it at all. I think there is a little roughness in the action, particularly during the Beast arc. There were times where I was just like, did I miss a panel? Like... There's like a scene where a character reveals her power. She, she, there's everyone's usually a beast user works with their beast, but there's one person who literally hollows out their animal and mm. then like kind of rides it almost like a mech, <laughs> like like a yes. fucking megazord. Uh, and she reveals this by like undressing out of the thing, and you're like, oh, she's inside of this bear. And then the next panel, she's talking to our antagonist, and he like in a layer, and I was like, I guess. She, the scene of, I guess she got this. back. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's just one of those things that I'm like, all right, I, there's like a little bit of a roughness there. Um, but by and large, this series works just so fundamentally well. Uh, it's genuinely like just charming to read. This is like almost hope core shit where you're just like, yeah, man, fucking the world's not so bad. You meet good people. Sometimes you fall in love. That's what it's all about, baby. Uh, and I genuinely just really liked it. It's also just got a fantastic sense of pacing, yeah. I think, uh, chapter to chapter. Um, like, it seems like every chapter that I've read of this is like, it's just like the perfect, like, quick read length of like, hey, fight scene, a couple of funny little bits, some sweet moments and stuff. Uh, and it's a weekly series too. It seems like because there's like 97 chapters of this, and it's been running since April 2022. So that's a weekly release schedule, um, and uh, it's available on Shonen Jump Plus. You can read it on Manga Plus. Uh, like you, you can read the entire series for free if Manga Plus is available to you. It's just got that weird Manga Plus thing of like each chapter is only viewable once, basically. Time. Right. Uh, so um, if you read like I would say the first like full mission of this and you're like this seems like fun i'll check it out i think you would enjoy the ride absolutely um and yeah i had a great time uh, reading this it was also nice to see you know just like in the first chapter like oh the, the main character is trying to protect his his sister's relationship with her girlfriend uh <laughs> just, just a nice little touch um and i also like how kinosaki is just portrayed as incredibly attractive. Uh, <laughs> so I wish that there was... I, I, I will admit I only got about 60, 65 chapters through this, and there's like 97. Uh, I'm going to read the rest of it. Yeah. Uh, because I had a great time. Um, I do wish that there would... In what I have read so far, I wish there had been more that Kinosaki was, like, doing... Because they're in that portion very much like the tag along while mm -hmm. Giro's doing assassin stuff. There could be more of that I'm not aware of yet. Yeah. Uh, uh, should also I know. Nitpick. <laughs> yeah. Well, should I, I do also just want to note that the manga is getting an official release from Viz as well. And when those volumes come out, they're also then available digitally through uh, the show to jump like Viz Vault. So. If you're patient uh, as well, you can also read. I think only six chapters are on there right now, but it, it does seem as though like once more uh, volumes are released, those chapters will then be available on the, the Shonen Jump site as well. Uh, in case you're like, 
I want to reread it again for free uh, or, you know, whatever. I don't have a Manga Plus subscription. I already read that right. chapter. They won't let me go back. Like, you can potentially at some point read them all through the Viz site as well. Or just buy the volumes. That's also, you know, depending on uh, what your, your level of voluntary commitment to this is. Absolutely. All right. And that's it. Marriage Toxin. It's good. I yep. liked it. Let's talk about other stuff. Let's talk about happened. other good manga. Oh, actually, I should ask, who was your favorite girl? My favorite girl? That's hard. Like, they're <laughs> they're all really good. I, I'm, um, I'm going to stand here on the shores and say she won me over from beginning to end. It's Kyoko, Himikawa, Shark Girl. I, I'm, I'm rooting for her all the way at this point. Honestly, I don't think it was, like, even, like, her story arc for Himikawa that I liked the most about her. I think it was her text exchanges with yes. Kuro that were the funniest. <laughs> it was, like, just, you know, her her shark text emojis and, and you know, like, her studying him when she's like, Hey, which bikini should I wear when we go to the beach together? <laughs> <laughs> okay, see you there. <laughs> yeah. Um... Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll may, I'm open to maybe changing my mind if the water girl actually becomes one of those characters. That was like a weird thing. They kind of were like, maybe? It is nice. It would be nice to have more characters where it's just, where they don't even bother with that, honestly. You know, mm -hmm. just like, this is just a female associate of yeah. Garros. And she does not care for him. Yeah, that that's regard. also kind of just a nice thing to have as well. I feel like they were sort of teasing like the the Sundare kind of character, but maybe they're not. Um, anyway, yeah, we have, we have a bunch of manga to talk about, so I guess we shouldn't hold up too long. Uh, let's, let's, let's get into it. Uh, yeah, My Hero Academia, chapter number 416, Wrench It Open, Izuku Midoriya. Uh, that is what Izuku is trying to do with uh, this, this plan, but there's a lot of like checking in on other people that happens in this chapter. First off, Eri, we saw her running to where Deku is. Turns out she was a lot less far along than it was kind of indicated. <laughs> like it was, in it, it was actually chapter. it was actually plot relevant that Ectoplasm was like Eri because he's like, no, what are you, you doing? <laughs> You're still at the school. Stop! Don't stop going. And she says, "I've got to help Deku." Aw. Like, Aw. Um, and they do actually like use this as a chance to explain that like that no literally like we cannot use the mechanisms of the shelters and stuff that got us put on a rail and led over here to go back because of the damage that has been caused with all these huge battles with like Machia and All for One and Dobby. Uh so you can't do that. Uh and also Hector Plasma points out that Ares rewind energy hasn't replenished yet, so she wouldn't even be able to help if she got there. Uh, apparently, this has been established because uh, Aizawa uh, also couldn't get uh, rewound from that. And there is such a cute little moment in this little flashback panel where, you know, Aizawa's been through a lot. Uh, he's lost an eye and can't use his quirk. He's lost a leg because he cut it off so that he could use it for a little while. And there he's all upset. And he just kind of flexes and goes... I got hit by a dump truck, but don't worry, I'm on the mend. <laughs> yeah. he, he's, he's trying to make her feel good. Yeah. Um, but Ectoplasm also says, I understand how hard this is for you, but all we can do now is just hope. Um, and she thinks about, you know, how, you know, Deku was really encouraging towards her and was like, oh, you've got a dream that makes me want to try extra hard and stuff. And of course now Deku is in full like carnage symbiote form because the way his black whip is causing him to appear all gross and scary and stuff. Uh, Coda uh, offers her a, a comforting hand though. Coda, the uh, little water kid that- mm -hmm. From back in the camp arc, ago. yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I think one of the first things we cover on this show. Uh, for for that from the series i should say um but Koda says like you know midori is like always looking like he's gonna burst out crying well i'm kind of a crybaby like him and when i see him fighting hard it makes me feel like i gotta take action too and he's starting to tear up because he's watching deku trying real hard on the broadcast of the fight i do think there's um, something very genuinely very sweet about these two kids connecting over their like shared love for deku i think this is yeah. Uh, excellent choice narratively also an excellent choice narratively hey remember that guy who said that one line in that one scene <laughs> i had no idea who this is i was like if this isn't can't you see kid then i don't know who the fuck this is uh 
basically this was the guy who when everyone was begging to let deku into the school was like okay but if we let him do that will we get to go back to our old lives eventually and he's like i don't know dude <laughs> <laughs> man there's a dude trying to blow up japan with his hands just let the kid fucking punch him all right he needs to take a bath and then he can punch the dude who's gonna blow up our town <laughs> Anyway, back then, Deku said, yes, I promise we'll bring it all back if we all work together, essentially. And now he's trying really hard to beat Shigaraki at this moment. And that guy is watching the fight, too. Um, the, this all is part of, like, a thing in this chapter, of course. Is, the, is... is that supposed to be? Because the people are pointing out the woman standing next to him is, like, a, a dog person with a shirt that says cat. Is that the same dog person we saw? No. Yeah, I was going to say, I didn't think this was the same one that Deku had saved. That before. girl is much taller. I was going to say. Like, I... She's like 10 feet tall. So. Yeah. Uh, so no, that's that's a different uh, beast girl. Just, just a fun little extra element to the scene where you sit there and you're like, is this a character I'm supposed to recognize or am I just horny for furries now? <laughs> Do I just have something to analyze about myself in the future? That's, that's, see, that's the thing, is that is that Horikoshi drops these furry characters in only every so often, so that you can't tell the trend that's being built. <laughs> I have uh, I have said this multiple times, that if you based, uh, if you were to make assumptions uh, based off just my favorite Magic the Gathering Planeswalkers, you would be like, oh, Quinn's 100% a furry, because <laughs> my two favorites are a Johnny, the big cat man, and Angrath, the big minotaur man. <laughs> Right. And I'm like, no, I just like, they're cool, dude. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. Uh, we cut over to where some of the heroes are in, like, full-on, like, well, shit, we've been through the ringer and we can't do anything to fight now mode. Um, so the base has been brought down safely, the one that they were fighting Shigaraki in previously. Uh, Kaminari, who was a battery for it, yes. is kind of being helped out by uh, Yayorozu. Uh, and they're watching the fight on, like, a little phone. Uh, oh, I thought she was playing a Nintendo 3DS. And I was like, <laughs> I mean, this is a kid. I, gotta get, I gotta get my dailies. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> I was like, that's weird. They haven't really supported that console in a while. But all right, you know, maybe maybe it's doing better in, in this version of Japan. <laughs> uh, She's like, sorry, I street passed, like, 70 fucking people <laughs> today. And I just need to clear these out. <laughs> Uh, they bring up that, like, oh, yeah, Midori is like, gone full, like, dark mode again and stuff. And then Kaminari is like, I've got a speech. So, <laughs> <laughs> look, I haven't gotten to do anything in a long time. Let me have a line, guys. <laughs> so, uh, he says, you know, characters in, like, manga that are like, I believe in my pal. You know, like, someone on the sidelines, they've got a buddy who will shout that kind of thing. Like me, or like Kirishima. Uh... I feel like I'm supposed to say that, and now you're just like, I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, you don't read Shonen. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah, it feels like Midoriya, he's like the strongest guy in the world right now, so why don't I feel like everything's gonna be okay? The way All Might used to inspire everyone. Does me being all anxious and worried mean I don't got faith in him? This is actually like a cool little character <laughs> decision of like, a little speech, like, I, it also kind of shows <laughs> but yeah it does show also like the difference kind of in ages that like the kids are like we see him trying so hard we want to try even harder but like his teenage friends are like we know he's trying really hard but why don't I fully like why am I really worried for him yeah he's like as, am I a bad friend <laughs> <laughs> and you're like no dude he very easily could die in the next second This he's fighting a ridiculously powerful villain mm. uh then we see a rescue chopper uh, taking off. They've got uh, Uraraka strapped in there. Uh, and also, Suyu is, like, watching her friend being hoisted away in a helicopter. This is, like, a oh, weirdly sad shot. Yeah, like, I was like, Suyu? I was like, why does Suyu look so sad? And then the next shot, they're like, actually, this girl might die. And I'm like, oh, that's why yeah. she's sad. Uh, UI robots are also coming onto the scene. And they're like, shit, this gravity girl it might not pull through. They this literally established that like she could die even after Toga did the blood transfusion for her. Um, Hawks uh, is also nearby, and Tokuyami and Hawks overhears this, and he's like, "Oh right, right, that's the girl who got on the megaphone to help to get everyone to let uh, Midoriya inside UA again." Um, 
Then, after we get a little bit of the flash between Shigaraki and Deku, we cut to Nagant, who got up on the hospital roof to do her cypher shot. Rocklock is there with her. And uh, she says, why did I fall after Midoriya? He managed to wrench open my heart. He has this special way of doing it, and there's nothing harder for a villain to bear than that. And Rocklock's like, well, yeah, that makes sense, because, you know, being villains is about getting them to lose the will to keep fighting. And I get that, that that's what he's trying to do right now. Uh, and Nagan says, he's not merely out to punish evil like it's black and white. The boy's dream is taking him down a thornier, more nuanced path. And that look on his face when he's up against the wall, running himself ragged, it makes you want to risk it all to back him up. And we get a shot of Deku's face, and he looks, like, torn up and beat up while he's going after Shigaraki, but he's still going for it. And it's, like, this big two-page spread with Deku on the top, his face, and then on the bottom, there's everyone watching on the screen in one of the shelters, and a single person goes, You can do it. And I swear to God, that was way more effective than, like, any big moment of like every character like yes we believe in you it's like this one person saying that like oh that's yeah. great <laughs> in a room of absolute silence one person doing it i mean this chapter isn't done but i, I will say i think this is one of the best chapters of my hero academia uh at least since like the fight with all for one kind of ended um it makes sense this chapter is like primarily just like i don't know what term i'd use for it but it's a chapter that's just like hey all these people are fucked up but let's show how they're fucked up in relation to the fact that Deku is in this gigantic fight and there are a lot of emotional connections between these characters and Deku because we've, we were shown in manga that's been running for over 400 chapters. Yeah. So we have a lot of characters and relationships to deal with. Um, so it was really cool just to be like, hey, everything's fucked up. Like as a pacey thing, it's just like strange because you're like... Mm -hmm. Are we in the are middle we, of... Are we going to finish the fight? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, it's like now for something a little different. Still kind of connected. Not completely different, but a little different. Uh, but then you're like, oh, actually, this was like a really effective way to set the stakes and get me super pumped for this. In terms of setting scope, uh, building up, you know, what, how meaningful this is to everyone from all these different walks of life, how Deku is connected with these people in different ways... Uh, we've got, you know, someone he has redeemed from being a villain. We've got little kids that he's saved. We've got teammates that are his own age. And we've got, you know, people who are kind of mentors that are now becoming more co-workers mm -hmm. uh, and how they look at him. And this is, you know, this is building at the moment where it feels like, you know, Deku is like going to be the next generation defining hero. Uh, because of how everyone is looking at and watching in this moment. But we do have two quick more pages before the chapter ends. There's just a shot of Shigaraki saying, get the hell away from me. Uh, but Deku comes charging in with a punch to launch this uh, attack. And as he does so, uh, the, the scene changes and he is instead rushing towards the house where that tragic event happened, where Shigaraki... Uh, destroyed everyone, destroyed his family, and turned into the person he is today. It's a nice house, so, by the way. Like just, yeah, it is. just as speaking from somebody <laughs> who's like appreciation, like as a you know, like at that age, make that's a good. House. That looks like a nice family home. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, untold evils uh, occurred within it, uh, but you know, on Zillow, it would do really well. <laughs> Yeah, like, uh, I, I would take advantage of the uh, low price point that would be set by, you know, the family murder that happened there. Also, uh, I, I think, would, like, was, it, was it part of the home destroyed in the process? The entire thing was destroyed. Yeah, I was going to so. say, so maybe, I guess you can't put it on market, but, like, you know, in a past way, like, appreciated old painting. Like, nice. All right. Undead Unluck. Yeah. Anyway, Greek chapter. Uh, Undead Unluck, yeah. number 198. Go! So, we start, Nick. As you do, on, on the moon! On the moon. <laughs> <laughs> As Luna is having a conversation with the first seat of the UMA Master Rules table, we, who is confirmed in this moment to be Soul. Luna notes it is very rare for Soul to show up here. And Soul just says, Yeah, well, it seems like they were talking about me, so I just came to get a closer <laughs> look. Um, we get some explanation. Uh, from Soul being like, man, they're kind of learning about me late, aren't they? Like, this is the final loop. 
and uh, Luna just explains, like, this is how it worked out. The two strongest people for the longest time were Victor and Juez, Undead and Unjustice. And they never had successors, so there was never anyone to, like, teach them and pass on souls or anything like that. They had no predecessors. So for Unluck, this is like the first time they had the opportunity there's like some note that it takes like 200 years of diligent pra practice to even recognize souls um but she has finally managed to do it and, and you know um soul is like well it's a good thing that beast ability was easy to figure out unluck managed to catch it onto it because of that and unbreakable looks like they figured it out so i think they're all gonna end up stronger now and uh luna's just like hmm, you seem pleased and he's like well i mean like if things had continued as they were they were going to get wasted before I'd ever get the chance to do anything. So I'm, you know, I'm looking forward to this. I have, I have high hopes for them. And he, he's watching this fight. And at this point, uh, soul just starts to kind of give color commentary to yeah. what's happening. Uh, he's watching. You see what they need to do here is they need to actually do it on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's John Madden. <laughs> Uh, Foucault should be doing here is she should be carrying the ball uh, underneath her arm and then just put all of her weight into the punch. Uh, you, see, you see, she went down to her knee right there and she shouldn't have done that. She should have kept on running. <laughs> yeah, you see, that's the issue with Jumanji. He's saying one more step, but as we can see, his knee's already down, so he actually is short of the goal line, so... Boom! <laughs> Boom! Tough acting to act in. All, all the John Madden jokes. Rest in peace. Oh, God. Yeah, um... Anyway, in in the actual fight, Fuka was like having. She's trying to like coordinate things. She's like, "Top, destroy all the ancient organizations around us. You do it with your unbreakable." So he's running around. He's breaking those things. Beast tries to attack them, uh, but uh, Haruka manages to deflect his attack with like an unbreakable sword that she has, or it's like a spear. Uh, and while that's going on, uh, Julia is flying around on uh, a part of Nidokuni. And is like grabbing souls that are leaving these creatures that have been revived. And we do get like a narration from Soul saying like she's collecting those pieces. Was it just technically an attack? So she is not breaking the rules as an extra participant. Very clever. Because basically once they would be killed they would go straight back to beast. But because she's holding on to them. Vuko is able to fire her soul bullets into these pieces of uh uh soul that julia is holding on right. to and then Which she are can... not protected by unbreakable yes yeah. and then they will be released and then brought back into beast this is also confirmation of what happened last week that i i wasn't completely sure on uh they said something looks like it just went into fuko and what they were saying is those pieces of her soul that she fired just went back into her that's that's the way using your soul essentially works um so beast knows that he's like i gotta put this soul in something else uh but top doesn't let that happen he he basically nope. yeah he, he jumps up and uh <laughs> missile drop kicks beast so fucking hard <laughs> that he shoots straight through him we don't find that out well, until like the next he, time he first like soccer dribbles the ball up so beast tries to put the soul in like a shark and top running along the water, kicks it back up towards him, mm -hmm. and then he drop kicks the soul into him. It's, it is a very, very cool conclusion. Uh, but I want to cut back to uh, Luna and Soul, because Soul at this point, after the drop kick happens, like, alright, that's it. We're gonna uh, time to get out of here. And she's like, you're not gonna stay till the end. He's like, eh, this is pretty much over at this point. Even a touch, uh, uh, even Unstoppable was touching Soul. So he'll encounter his predecessors at some point in time, and that's it. And she's like, oh, you're giving them a lot, of, a lot of credit. There's no guarantee they can manage such a feat. And Soul's like, what are you talking about? You raised them to be that way, didn't you? And she's like, mm, what, do you, what do you mean by raised? I simply seek the greatest form of life. And she's like, that's Sun's goal. Yours is different. Sun created the UMAs and you created the artifacts. But the world's first UMA, me, wasn't created by Sun. It was you, wasn't it, Luna? And Luna, again, this is a figure that really has no defining characteristics, but there is, like, a small smile as they're, like, sipping their tea. Uh, and Soul's just like, why did you give birth to me first? Why did you give people potential? And what is your goal? Mm -hmm. And <laughs> basically, 
Luna replied, it's like, I find this more amusing. And this is straight up like fucking Frodo being like, all right, then keep your secrets, old man. <laughs> Soul's just like, all right, I guess I'm out of here then. Uh, but before he leaves, he's looking off and he says, see you, beast. If we win, we can meet again. And we cut to a two-page spread that shows Top has missile drop kicked his way straight through uh, Beast. Uh, broke through using the unbreakable and unlock combo. Everyone is cheering. And our final page is a narration of the quest details. That This is the neutralization of UMA Beast. The participants are unlock, unbreakable, and unstoppable. The mission is successful. And the reward is the addition of two seats to the round table. And we end with the uh, Arca jumping out and, and grabbing on, giving Top like a big hug. Yeah, like big old tackle hug that also apparently knocks their heads together. So be yeah. more careful next time you yeah. want to glomp your love interest. Uh... Yeah, Top, Top had taken off his helmet at that point. So they, yeah. they both just got small concussions. <laughs> Uh, I like uh, that the way that this whole thing is framed, it's a very weird like, and, and jarring moment uh, because we got all the buildup of like, oh my god, they're discovering these soul things and stuff. And then the conclusion of the fight happens like half off screen. It's because the emphasis is not placed on the actual action. It's the meaning of the connection to soul, not just in terms of like, oh, this is a new power that's been unlocked but this is part of the chess game that's being played between Luna and Sun. Uh, and there are still, like, things you can see, like, for example, when it pulls back uh, to that wide shot of Soul asking, why did you grant people potential? You can see that on the Earth, Top is going multiple times <laughs> around the globe in order to build a momentum to kill Beast. Um, but this is a very interesting, like, character wrinkle that we've been presented for Soul as someone who is very knowledgeable and observant uh, and clearly not just like a knight templar for son seems to have his own reasons for doing things yeah. seems to look at things as like probably there seems to be uh, based on his line if we win we'll see each other again it seems to be like their the umas are just as much puppets as humans are uh in in this war i think and Okay, sorry, finish your thought. Well, oh, just, just I, I like that he has all these observations and doesn't seem to care about winning. He's just, you know, he's concerned with being with things being more interesting because he's seemingly been around for a long time. Yeah, I do think he is definitely going to be the most intriguing member of the UMA Council. Uh, I think there's a level that. I mean, these are the people he spends all of his time with. So in a way, he does look to these people like friends in a way. Maybe not friends, but like compatriots or some kind of family. Because it does seem to be some level of remorse when he's like, ah, see a beast. Like, maybe we'll, yeah. if we win, we'll get to see each other again. And he was all for trying to help, you know, his side escape and like all of them invade at once or whatever. Um, so I think there's a level of that. But he does seem to have like a bit of a complicated kind of narrative to himself and of course the idea that uh the umas were first created by luna seemingly is i don't know maybe a gambit to get to, to get sun to like unlock all give all give out all these weird powers and stuff um mm -hmm. yeah um but we'll find out more of that about, about that eventually uh for right now hey we won. Good job. Yeah, guys. good job. This is a cool <laughs> chapter as well. I uh, I don't know. Soccer kicking a soul up so then you can missile drop kick it through a person's body is probably one of the coolest things you could do. Nice. Chapter 140 of Blue Box. B -b 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 Blue Box. A senpai's love. Uh, Haru has lost the first game in his match against Taiki, but is taking control of the second game. He's kind of stretched out like a uh, He's got basically a two to one uh, margin of lead uh, in this match. Uh, and so people are like, oh, he's really kicked things up a notch. And then we go into a flashback from Hari's perspective again, where he goes over his thoughts on Taiki, uh, which is like, hey, when you know I first saw this guy, his shots were wobbly. He had bad follow through. He didn't have any decisiveness, but he had the determination to tough it out. And there were people who were observing, like, hey, he's got the potential. He's got ambition. 
uh, and then Haru looks over at Taiki, sees him very obviously looking through like the bar the barrier in the gym over at Shinatsu during her basketball pro practice, uh, and he just like, Haru just thinks to himself, well, he's got a heart that aims high, <laughs> but <laughs> it's gotta be kind of hard <laughs> to get she. Um. And, you know, there's, like, a conversation later on where someone's like, oh, man, I talked to her. What, you like her? And it's not like that. She'd never look at me twice. She's more like an unattainable beauty, someone to worship. And he's like, all right. <laughs> it's whatever. Um, but then he just goes over to her and just asks her straight up, like, never liked anyone before? I love, I just, love like, this. Such a good joke. She just like, sure. And she's <laughs> she points to these like NBA players. Yeah. I, one of them was like Steph Curry. I was going like, to say, the only one I could truly make out, I think, is Steph Curry. I don't know enough about basketball to be able to figure out who everyone else is. But it is very funny that she's like, yeah, of course. I love a I whole like bunch of guys. people. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so Haru thinks to himself, like, you know, her total lack of romantic inclination might be a good thing, but maybe he's got a chance. Yeah. <laughs> Stranger things um, have happened. Yeah. So he's like, I mean, hey, you know, maybe he can do it. So it's one of those things where, like, Hari was, like, apparently one of the first people to realize that Taiki had a crush on Shinatsu. <laughs> um, but eventually Taiki, you know, approached him and was like, hey, can you give me some advice? Because you were, like, you were watching me just now, right? <laughs> and Hari's thoughts drift to, like, look, not paying any mind to how slim his chances with Jinatsu are. Instead, always keeping his eyes straight ahead. That's what I've come to understand is his strong point. Um, and we get a moment of when they were playing a doubles match together and sucking really bad, getting beat like 15 to 4 uh, uh, because they're going to get strong opponents. And so he's like, yeah, I need to be able to play at like a higher speed and stuff, but Taiki's here. I don't know if I can do that. And Taiki just spoke up in the moment and was like, hey, Haru Senpai, come on, let's speed things up. I, I can't stand being a burden to you. It's a waste of your talents to slow down, so I'll keep up with you. So let me hand here. Yeah. And uh, so they, the, that was a big defining moment for Haru going forward. Then he also saw Chinatsu checking out Taiki uh, and it's like hmm yeah <laughs> so Haru's a sharp guy it seems like he's the only one in this school who has Riz so it would make sense that he, he picks up on things right he's the only character at this point uh, prior to Taiki and Shinatsu getting together that's been established to have his own relationship <laughs> so yes, like yeah he's, he's just the only person everyone else is just like uh, what do I do uh, and Haru thinks, you know, like, kind of, like, recapping, like, his entire experience with Taiki, I was happy to watch him grow, because I'm his senpai. His worries were ones that I'd had myself, and I wanted him to overcome those roadblocks and get stronger. That's a senpai's love. Uh, and as he, you know, gets back into the match against Taiki, you know, it's picking up the pace again, he's just kind of urging Taiki mentally, get stronger. Uh, and then we get another flashback of the time that Taiki actually beat Yusa in a match, which even blew him away. Uh, uh, but then he had the thought of, like, I might be more small-minded than I thought, because I am happy that Taiki won, but only two players can go to nationals. And with that on the line, my happiness is outweighed by my desire to win. How we've practiced together all this time, how I've thought of him as a teammate, our relationship as junior and upperclassmen, none of that matters. On the court, he's my enemy. So sports manga. So <laughs> cool. <laughs> it, it's very, very cool. This manga doesn't know how to do the action of a sports manga, but it knows how to do the emotion of a sports yeah. manga, which maybe is the most important thing. It is. It is. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and that's basically where we end the chapter is, you know, Taiki is kind of like realizing that Haru is acknowledging him as a proper rival, uh, which makes him happy. Yeah. Uh, and that's it. So we're going to see if Taiki can get back control of this, uh, this game. Yeah, it should be good stuff. Uh, it's very, very strong chapter. Um, let's talk about Chainsaw Man. Wrong. Chapter 158, Gyoni Guillotine. Uh, so Fami drops the 
ob uh, in her hand. Uh, and as the uh, guards uh, pull out their guns, I like how in the middle of all this, as they're getting ready to shoot, Asa just goes, I tripped. <laughs> it's like, yeah, yes, I Yeah, tripped. I'm sorry, girl. Uh, got machine guns, fire! And then they look up at the thing that they have shot, which is, how do I describe this? It is a giant it's a bird. Skeleton. It's a skeleton wearing uh, like a feather cape that has a guillotine under the cloak and has a head of a pigeon. <laughs> Nick, what's uh, so hard about this? Don't you see yeah. one of these every day? Fami refers to it as guillotine and says, slaughter them. And the guillotine goes, guilty! <laughs> so... Uh, if you've ever wondered what sound uh, guillotine pigeon skeletons make, that's it. Yeah. Because that's all it says. Canonical, uh, I believe, actually. Guillotine rushes forward, and their guns are sliced apart, and their clothes are sliced apart and fall off. And they're all completely unharmed, <laughs> except they're naked. This, this they're like, Every so often, Nick, uh, you run into like a fan of heroes who is like delusional about how horny their series is and if you bring it up you're like well she just had a match against somebody that if she lost she would have to bark like a dog and strip they're like yeah but remember that one time in chainsaw man the guillotine devil cut everyone's clothes off and i'm like i i've never met such a bad faith argument about manga before <laughs> like come on i don't know how to tell you these are completely different circumstances also of course fujimoto is horny that's that's something yeah. you can have to suss out <laughs> Have you seen, have you seen the two-page spread? You know, <laughs> the two-page spread. Yeah. Um, so I like how this was not like a measure of mercy or anything. Because Fami immediately goes, I told you to kill them all. <laughs> <laughs> Kiyoti just goes, Kyoti! So, yeah. Um, Asa demands to know why she didn't just summon this thing earlier. Fami says, the devils I summon with my power are weak. They can't use their full strength. Fucking bullshit! <laughs> the falling devil! What are you talking about? Well, that that was summoned via another character, wasn't it? That big oh, worm thing? I guess. The justice devil pretender, right? I can't. I cannot remember this. I just remember there was a big worm thing, and when they killed there that, was. the falling devil left because it's like, all right, the person who made my contract is is gone now. True enough. Uh, so and Fami is also like, also I've got restrictions, like, so I can't really use this ability very much. Uh, also wants to know what restrictions there are, and Fami's like, no. Uh, one of the guards who fortunately did not have his underwear chopped off rushes in, just tries to punch <laughs> this. Uh, uh, <laughs> bravo for at least trying. Because it's not like the guillotine devil has disappeared. <laughs> like, no, it's still there. It's still there. To be like, all right, <laughs> oh, guns didn't work. It's time to go with the old gun show. Asa blocks it and kind of, well, she ducks and blocks. And then Yoru takes over and kicks the dude in the chin. Uh, and, and actually gives her, like, some props. Like, hey, good job pairing it and stuff. So Asa's like, yeah, I've had to pick up a few, you know, tricks. Because remember, Asa's got one arm. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> uh, the dude on the ground is like, please don't kill me. And you're always like, lick my shoes. All right. <laughs> See, told you. Told you. Food you know what? Horny. It is horny. Never mind. I'm sorry, yeah. Hero fans. Shane Man's just as horny. Uh, a door creaks open. And one of the guards realizes, like, oh, you must be here to break them out. Uh, and it's the Devil Hunters Club from Asa's school. They're all here. In yeah. Prison guard, Ma I guess. Main guy, uh, Kobeni sibling, third guy. <laughs> right. Um, and so the president says, like, Fami, you came to break us out? Get behind me. Leave us alone, Fami. Go away. Our families, our lives, our country. You ruined everything. We're terrorists now. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to follow your orders anymore. I'm my own man, and I'm going to start by expelling you guys from the Devil Hunter Club, effective immediately. Oh, that'll tell them. You, F Fammy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Asa, Asa says, we're not here for you, losers. We're here for Chainsaw Man. And so immediately the president's like, Chainsaw Man? Chainsaw Man's here? He's like, yeah, whatever. 
so Asa and Hami run off, and uh, yeah, the, the Vondra Squad is joining them now. It's like, I could be Chainsaw Man and bring up the rear as guillotine, just going, Cody, because that's all he can say. And that's our chapter. This was wacky and weird. This is such a funny chapter, but I do enjoy it. Uh, I'm to tell you one thing I don't enjoy. Uh, our audience picked the guillotine devil to be character of the week, uh, which is fine. Uh, you know, my votes could change. Maybe it changes by the end of the show. I know Haru is getting some votes, but they they picked the guillotine devil. Sure. Totally get it. They chose to go with the nickname that she uses. I have no fucking idea. To pronounce. Gee, 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 gee. <laughs> I have no gee. fucking clue how to say it that way. It is going to be the guillotine devil to be very, very clear. Right. Uh, but this is a fun chapter that is very, very silly, uh, kind of cool. I like some of our foreshadowing pieces being put in here, uh, and just, I don't know, this is enjoyable. This is, this is a good time. It's reminded us how strong Asa is as a character, and I love just seeing Fami get to be very deadpan and silly. Yeah. It's good stuff. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's a kind of a joke you can see a mile coming, uh, it's joking you can see coming a mile away as well, but the president of the Devil Hunter Club being like, we don't want anything more to do with you guys. Oh, Chainsaw Man's here and I could meet him. Oh, we're going to go with you guys. <laughs> yeah, we're out here. Um, All right. Are we going to talk about Kaiju number eight B-side still? Does anything happen in this chapter? Really? <laughs> Kikoru apparently gets a sword that I don't remember her having. They're like, oh, it, we're making it, you a it must. It's like the prototype to her axe. That's what I was going to say. I was like, I know she has an axe. And there is a level of uh, discussion. I don't know if it's meant to be a joke or not. I know the new Final Fantasy VII game just came out. And I don't know if it is a way to say, like, Kikoru is kind of like Cloud. Because she has a very Cloud. And this is straight up like a buster sword. sword. This is a right. giant sword. And I was like, I don't remember this maybe in the process of this this is this is like a side story about how kikoru got her iconic axe um but this was uh, very strange to me yeah i think that that's basically it i mean like she she gets gets called in she's told like oh you're gonna you're gonna get like a custom weapon uh so then they have her practice with it she feels like i don't know it feels like i'm not getting the most out of it so they're like well uh, we've got some captured Honju that uh, you could test it out on, and then they're like, so yeah, do that. Uh, the only thing that I really take away from this chapter is that we're getting to see more of how Mina leads her squad, because mm -hmm. she's the one who comes up with the idea and makes the call like, yeah, you can handle those things, so we're going to test out your weapon that way. Uh, but uh, that's really all I have to say about it. It's it, it's a, it would take a lot longer to go through this page by page, because it's just like Kikoro kind of hangs out after training a little bit. We see that the guys are being doofuses when they're weight training. Uh, and we see the female characters talk for a I, little bit. I was going to say, <laughs> I appreciate it in a way if we get to see, again, more of this squad. It's almost, it's such a weird backwards way that this has happened. That we spent so much time with that division specifically and everything like that. And the moment Kafka had to leave the division, they were like, actually... All of these characters were significant and important to the story. There were deep treasured relationships between all of them. And you're like, I, I, I guess. I wish we could have seen some of this beforehand. There's another female character I didn't know about. I, I remember the big girl. There's another girl who looks a lot like the girl from the first division. Uh, so I, there was a part of me that's like, did they retroactively say she's a part of the third division? <laughs> um, but yeah, it's really just about her getting a sword. And also, I like the face that Kikoru makes when uh, the guys yell and make a lot of noise behind yeah. her when her hair stands up. It's funny. Yep. All right. That's that. Oh, uh, fuck me. All right, Quinn. Fuck. God damn it. No. Fuck. We had to get through Kaiju number eight quickly so that we could get to this. <laughs> I forgot I'm already here. Hold on. I have to reopen it. Oh, Jesus. All right. Eden Zero. Zero. Chapter 279. Super Ziggy. What a great fucking title. I want to talk about guess that. How much, guess how much of this chapter Ziggy's in. Hint, it's not the whole thing. <laughs> I need to talk about the color page before we can even get into it. So the color page is the four shining stars. There's an art style to it that's like a little strange. I don't know how to quite place it, but like it's slightly different for Hero, at least like in terms of the way like coloring and shading is being used. 
but it's all for the the uh, shining stars, and they all have some element to them that incorporates the person they care the most about. For so for um, mother or uh, witch, sorry, it's Shiki. Uh, for Hermit, there's a little Weiss like dangly thing on her. Uh, Valkyrie has Hamor on her cap. Sister has a tattoo of Rebecca on her hip. Yes. Which is unnerving because I don't know if those characters have had any connection to one another outside of Sister assaulting her regularly. Yeah, so that's a deep connection, Gwen. <sighs> sure. Also, her, her Valkyrie does not look like Valkyrie is supposed to look. No. I, I had no idea who this was at first. I thought there was an entirely... I thought this was like a movie character or something. And then I was like, they aren't making movies for this series. I'm also trying to figure out what angle she's holding her arm at that that perspective happens. Because her hand's like perfectly level with like right here yeah she's not hold. she's not holding her arm far back enough it looks too big yeah it's 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 so definitely it's like it's, the arm is like growing out of her shoulder from the elbow it's yeah. very weird anyways to the chapter itself is uh noting that the, the connection to the Eden zero has has dropped so they're weren't wondering if something happens but uh rebecca's like hey shiki what did you mean that you're gonna destroy the chronophage she's like well i'm gonna destroy the chronophage yeah i'm just gonna <laughs> punch it really hard because if I don't, this this cosmos will never know peace. And uh, Happy's like, can you destroy it? It's sort of like punching a hurricane, as we talked about before. And Cheeky, without elaborating, just says, yeah, it's going to be my last job. And Rebecca's like, don't say last. And he's like, sorry, not last. I meant it'll be the finale to this adventure. A series it's great bliss. that our characters talk like people, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Just, you know, say normal things like that aren't like meant to be trailer lines with every other word <laughs> that they speak. Yeah. Hero uh, put his whole hero scene into that line. Usually uh, this series comically underwritten. That was a, an, an area where he went to the tank for a bit too long. Um, the Eden Zero is being uh, harangued by the Eden's One. There are fights breaking out in there. Cure is fighting Jin and Clean. Jin's like, Clean, go get control of the ship. And uh, Kira's like, oh, I'm going to stop you. And then Jin cuts him into pieces. And he's like, I guess he's already dead. But then Kira puts himself together. And he's like, I have regeneration power, stupid. You should have remembered this from the other world. That was a significant moment. And Jin's like, I guess I do remember. And he takes off his cloak. It was a pain in the neck. Cut over to Homura. She's running around, basically seeking out the energy signature for... Um, Oh, God, what's her name? Lady Freya, I think. And she's like, ah, there's an energy signature from our hot springs room. Nick, if this is if this is the finale of all of our finale. series, we've got to say we're defining climactic battle. You couldn't end friends without them saying goodbye to Central Perk. You cannot end Eden Zero without a final goodbye to the hot springs room. We go inside. There's just a pair of legs sticking out from underneath the hot spring. And at first I was like, this is like a funny character. I'm so excited. This is like a real goofball. Um, but then the character just like heats their body up so much that all the water evaporates. And she's just laying upside down. But she's like a very serious character. Because she immediately hops back up and she's like, ah, yes, I must tell you, I was uh, created on a certain planet to be used as a weapon of war and I was programmed with every strategy and uh, the knowledge to use every weapon uh, and I was super duper powerful but I rejected their plan and I you know didn't want to solve the human interest I had interest of strength so I wanted to see what it could do and I ended the war by killing 1.6 billion humans from both sides which hey, that actually that's actually a significant number. Good job, this, this 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 makes sense. A planetary situation, one point six billion is a lot. Uh, so she swipes her hands out real quick to show off how cool she is, and all of Hamora's clothes are chopped off. Scenic, just like uh, uh, Fujimoto. It's 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 the same level. Uh, Hamora is now naked for the rest of this chapter. Uh, Lady Freya says some weird line she's like i thought it's customary for people to disrobe upon entering the bath you burned all the bath water lady it doesn't work anymore <laughs> you're just horny 
This is so weird because immediately Homura's like, oh my god, she's so fast. This will be the strongest opponent I've ever faced. He's like, yes, this is presumably the final fight that Homura will have in all of Eden Zero in the big finale. And she's naked for no reason. <laughs> <laughs> Not no reason, Nick. Horny reasons. Uh, oh yeah. She she is she is nude and she's also scared. She just don't. She's like I could not see a single flash of this person's sword. My legs are shaking, but no, my legs must carry me forward. So she marches forward. Her nipples are gone. Uh, Ziggy and Void fucking gravity punch each other, and Ziggy's like, man, my gravity powers are even, aren't they? And Void. It's like, but I also have the powers of time I haven't used until now. So he, like, time flashes to attack him from behind. I love how everyone talks like they're human in this <laughs> series, Quinn. And it's then, so natural, the dialogue. And then Ziggy's like, bitch, and slaps him. He knew exactly where he was going. And he's overdrived, and he punches a big hole through Void. Whoa, that's where the chapter ends. We're on so many cliffhangers, Nick. Who knows what exciting things will happen next week? Will Hamora have to fight the whole battle naked? Will we have to kill Cure again? I don't re remember how they beat him last time. I think they just punched him really hard. That's how most conflicts in this series end. Do you think Void is dead and the series is over? No. Damn. Uh, Damn! I, I needed you, I, Nick! I needed you to say yes! I... You cannot tell you how, for such a simple, stupid chapter, how much this annoys me. <laughs> this it's, thing, it was. It's not even just what happens within it, which is all right. We've got two fights happening, which are probably going to be disappointing and stupid. Uh, one of which is Amura is naked for it, and then there's of course the battle between Ziggy and his not son, uh, mm -hmm. where. But it's the way that everything is done, where everything feels clunky. Everyone speaks unnaturally. They talk in exposition mode for a lot of it, it feels like. Just that moment where Ziggy's like, ah, oh, it seems our gravity powers are evenly matched. And then Void goes, but I have powers over time. He's like, you, you, you both know this! You both know what each other's powers are! Ah, like, uh, but my plus one fire sword counters your ice shield and lowers your defense by six. It's like, Stop it! Shut up! Stop <laughs> Stop talking! Just, there's not a good line in this entire chapter. Ugh. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, bad, bad chapter. Let's move on and talk about a good, good series, Green, Green, Greens. Keep up yeah. those cheese. It's a good, good, good. Chapter 14, The Talent to Strive for the Ordeal. Very cool color page uh, to to uh, start this off with uh, Haku doing a drive as that caps hats flying off and and everything. Um, so last time uh, Oliver said like you're going to beat Natashiko on the next hole to uh, to Haku, and uh, so and so you know Haku's gonna be like what are you doing what are you doing because Oga's like fighting worse fighting worse engage. <laughs> Uh, but Oliver says, like, it's because this next hole is your best chance for getting a birdie today. It's your only shot at beating that Ishigo. Uh, because I can see the path you have to actually make a birdie. Uh, and of course, Oga's like, are you saying that you can beat me with your help? And Oliver's like, well, odds aren't zero. How about it? You win? And Haku's like, yeah, all right. I, I came here to get a birdie. And Oga's again like, I'm not going to go easy on you. I'm going to try and beat you. I'm going to destroy you. <laughs> I will kill you <laughs> in golf. Uh, I love it because Oliver then... Oliver has become a character from a completely different manga since this thing happened. Like he, he's just he's like, yes, let's see what I yeah. Uh, and then there's a little bit with Toto at the end of all of this where she's like, I'm just gonna play like I normally do. <laughs> <laughs> she's like, I don't know what weird shit you all have going on i'm just gonna play my game normally to be very clear ignore all of you weirdos and your shonen bullshit so uh so the big part of this hole and why oliver says that haku's got a chance at winning is that there is a big curve uh in the range so you have to hit the ball one way and then do like a 90 degree angle and go the other way to get around this big dividing uh this big border of trees but oliver says you've got the power to make a shortcut here 
that Oga cannot because she just can't drive the ball as hard as you can. So, you know, Oga drives and she drives in one direction normally. And then Oliver's like, look, first shot takes the most guts, nail it. And you will get on the range if you go over the trees here at the right angle. And Aku hits it and uh, it, it goes over and Oliver can hear it hitting solid ground, which suggests like sensitive hearing to some degree because they're outdoors. Nah, like, there's yeah. got to be other noises. Now nah, they, they, like... they put a little cat bell in every golf ball. So when it lands, you can hear like a ding. <laughs> You're like, ah, oh, okay. Uh, so they, you know, they get in the cart and they move and then it's like, okay, so, you know, Oga will do her approach first. She's very serious now, like deep breathing and, and stuff. Uh, hits the ball and she manages to make the green from where she is. Uh, and then she immediately turns like, well, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> I was like, all right, next up, it's, it's, it's your turn. And Haku is only 92 yards from the hole. So Oliver tells him like, all right, what you gonna do? And Haku's like, wait, what? Oh, I, I just told you, you had a chance to make a birdie from here, but you know, it's, it's up to you. Like if you're getting a birdie if you can't you can't get it if you're not consistent from within 100 yards so i have like set it up for you. it's up to you to make it from here so haka says well what would you do in my place and oliver says like oh i'd take the shot and uh he um you know he takes his shot while haka was watching he's like yeah now i'm in the realm of like getting a birdie because i, I got from here to be on the range and Haku's like, oh my god, that was amazing. And Oliver's like, oh yeah, like if you're if you're good within a hundred yard range, you've basically won this hole after you've gotten into this position. Uh, so Haku's like, okay, can you like swing like that for that shot again? And he's observing the arc and he's trying to mimic it as well. And Oliver is just again like you know commenting internally about Haku's like innate skills, like he's got this good eye, he can pick all of this up just from seeing it once. Uh, and so Aka's like, okay, I can do this. I can do this. And he goes to hit the ball, and it just dribbles forward like 10 feet. He just screws it up. And he's like, ah, oh, damn it, damn it. And Oliver, you know, grabs him by the shoulders, and he's like, hey, come on, don't sweat it. Go for par. Uh, and uh, so Haku, Haku thinks to himself, it would be, it could be done, if it could be done at a glance, there wouldn't be any challenge to it. And he thinks back to what the manager told him, which is golf is a sport about recreating the ideal. And he thinks to all the times that he has, you know, watched someone doing something so perfectly, has tried to do it himself, and has fucked it up. Uh, you know, watching Oliver's putting and he can't match it. Watching Oga's driving and he can't do it. And watching everyone else perform really well and him getting these massive scores in all these holes while he's playing alongside them. So uh, he's kind of gone into a trance and he's like, if I could recreate the ideal coolness, I'm sure that I'd have more fun. Whose 100 yard shot is the ideal, I wonder? And he goes back in his freaking mind palace and he gets this memory of a ball being hit like exactly 100 yards. It's like, okay, yeah, that. I remember it was hot. They were hitting balls one after the other. The cicadas were noisy. Who was it? Who was it that I was watching hitting that hundred yard shot? I feel like it was just before then. He's like, he's conjuring the entire memory. And within the memory, it's himself hitting the shot. And he just says to himself as, as he watches himself hit it, that's pretty cool. So he grabs a club. It's an eight iron, and uh, he's like, he goes, all right, plant my feet at the wall. And again, he breaks through the wall, that visual that we've seen from him before. And as it arcs through the air, he thinks, I've always envied other people. Look up to them as the cool ones. But even imitating them, that just left me feeling empty. Because I can't become someone else. And Oga's watching the ball in shock. Toto's watching it and, and starts going, come on, come on. Oliver starts doing the same thing. And Haku realizes, even before the ball lands, I did it. And the ball goes right into the hole. 
dings the the pole that's that's sitting in it as well. And he thinks to himself again, golf is a sport about recreating the ideal. A sport where you're always chasing an ideal that's out of reach. And for the first time, I made myself that ideal. Hell yeah. This is a great chapter. Uh, awesome chapter. Great, great lesson from Haku. Great, like, seeing himself visualize himself finally and recapture that moment of breaking through the wall and it's cool that like he just nails this shot i've heard some people say like oh the series is getting canceled it's rushing through his first goal i think this is actually naturally where you'd want to do this i don't think they were gonna put us through 18 different chapters of him going through each hole and be like did i get a birdie right. on this one no like i think there was just a point you had to you know speed it up a little bit and then we'll probably like shortcut through the rest of the the, the uh golf match here in the next chapter or something like that um, but I think it's really works. That that said, still don't know how this series will do long term. Um, mm -hmm. but you know, I uh offer out a jar of blood. Don't ask me where I get it. As an offer it every night to ensure <laughs> this series uh will exist in the future. And uh, I put a little pirate ship in it, and then there's a little jump uh gremlin that comes out. That's like Arr! and it drinks it up, <laughs> and then uh we'll get 17 more chapters of green green greens. <laughs> So there you go, guys. I mean, if that's happening, then clearly. <laughs> <laughs> so if if we get a whole bunch more of green, green, greens, you could thank me in the blood I leave out. Just don't ask where the blood comes from. Absolutely, yes. Um, what was the most recent one? I remember. I wonder here. Hang on. Let me see if I can find this. Uh, oh, Nick, we can't delay ourselves from getting a new sexorcist. <laughs> Yeah, well, maybe we can. Uh, <laughs> actually, uh, I'm going to go check out what's been going on on Dynamite, actually, just there's real like quick. Least... Oh, hey, Mercedes Monet. All no. right. Oh, that's there's interesting. A, there's, there's at least four series that it's ahead of right now. Yeah, it's it's not at the bottom. Uh, we don't know how many series will end up um, being needed for the next cut. Mm -hmm. uh, but there is also the chance that Jujutsu Kaisen or my hero academia could be done by i have no idea <laughs> i don't yeah. think so uh, but it could happen let's move on then to new sexorcist yes chapter 41 protect everyone until the very end uh yeah so they're going up against this level four spirit thing the very humanoid looking one now gakuro is going for a killing blow and uh, he just thinks to himself, like, Oh, get, go create a distraction with this strike and get everyone out of here! Xenoblade! Uh, and then he just freezes there. Uh, and the level four spirit says, Ah, it's you. You killed someone in my family. And there is this giant claw that grabs him that then just turns into the spirit's human hand which i guess is just an indication like it fe he feels the presence of this thing's monstrous form um and while he's still being held still like he's still in the striking motion gakura is just still there while the level four looks at me it's like hey you know that level three that was guarding the perimeter he was part of our family his name was suchi we had known each other for more than 20 years, and he was obedient, hardworking. He would call out the names of humans and try to act like them and eat them uh, <laughs> like an innocent guy did. He was really admirable. Wouldn't you agree? And he's got just like a single big tear trail going down one cheek while he says this. And he's looking all creepy and stuff. And everyone else is like, oh, my God, this guy's got a crazy, overwhelming aura and all that. Uh, and Lovor says, you're the one who killed him, right? Don't you have anything to say? Uh, and then, uh, uh, t Cross Tank is like, oh no, he's super strong. A level four can be really strong and smart and stuff. Also, they get uh -huh. stronger the older they they are, the more mature in appearance. And this guy looks like an adult, so we're all screwed. A lot be of, careful, a lot Lord of Gakuma. lore. That's a lot of lore to dig into. It's great the way that we just, like, have all these terms just thrown at us. And then no time to digest any of them. Anyway. So, Gakuro pauses and says, He must have been very important to you. He killed your dad, Gakuro! Say that! <laughs> He's trying to so, empathize. He's like, oh, I'm sorry I killed your monster friend. 
Yeah, so he's like, oh, I, to, I should just, if he's talking to me, I should engage back until backup arrives. It's See, like, plan. yeah, th that's the thing, is that it's supposed to be part of his plan. And there is, like, a level that, like, that actually could have been kind of an interesting detail, but Gakuro doesn't have, like, a personality. So, like, it's yeah. not like he is, like, I actually am very sorry that, like, I killed your friend. He's just like, oh, I gotta think of something. Sorry, your friend's dead. Got him, Gakuro. That should kill 20 to 30 minutes right there. <laughs> he's like, I discussed this. And how sorry I am! An intricate detail! <laughs> uh, I'm gonna, little... I'll list off a thousand ways I'm sorry! Number one! I peed myself! <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't seem to have anything to do with how sorry you are. Number two! <laughs> Number two! I blamed it on my sister! <laughs> So she peed your pants? That's what I tried to get away with you. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I went for. They're like, Gakuru, did you pee your pants? He's like, no, Shitatsu did it! <laughs> anyway, uh, the Love Four Spirit's like, all right, I done it. And he just has Karasu Tengu now. And he's like, yeah, my ability is to turn spirits into allies. So, yeah, I just kind of, like, did it. And now I'm in control of the barrier. Cool. So, yep. Gonna kill y'all now. Uh, I'm going to kill all your friends first, though, so just stand there. Because you're their leader, so I'm going to make you all suffer. And then now Gakuro's like, everyone run! Uh, and instead, they're all just kind of standing there, uh, shaking. I, I, I do love it. This is I don't know if this is intentional. But, again, Gakuro doesn't say, everyone run. He says, everyone run! <laughs> There's no, like, exclamation point to create, like, a sense of urgency. This is just Gakuro's level. He's like, guys! There's a sword coming! I think we should go, and then like it cuts, and all of his all of his friends' heads <laughs> just been decapitated. He's like, "Oh, I should have been more urgent about this." You know, Quinn. There are some times when you can test like the character of someone uh, in times of great crisis. Uh, you know, what what comes out of them uh, is a true indication of who they are deep down. Because you know, of course, we all like in a way uh, we cast ourselves in different roles. We wear many different masks and kind of in that way distort who we truly are at our core mm -hmm. uh, and so when you disturb all of that when you put someone in a situation where they have to act without thinking uh, the big thing that comes out of them is, is is who they really are deep down and Gakuro when he is placed in the situation the thing that comes out of him is RAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAAA
running won't work. I'm going to have to do it. Now, mind you, that doesn't really explain why Shitotsu and uh, Sua uh, also didn't run. <laughs> but I guess yeah. they're all equally as scared. They're all just scared. You know, there's these frightened girls. Yeah. And Gakuro's the bra big brave boy. I mean, it's tough. I mean, when you especially think of what Sua and uh, Shiroha had to do earlier, where they both had to be topless for a while, that's a lot <laughs> for like a teenage girl to have to put up with. <laughs> so, like, they're emotionally probably spent today, like maybe for the week. So, like, the fact Absolutely. that they're even standing is is huge. The the fact that they tried to escape by saying, "Can we go to the bathroom?" <laughs> That took, last, that took the last of their nerves. After that, they're like, "Oh man, I hope I own it. I hope I don't have to get in any <laughs> any more dire situations." I hope today. I don't have to dodge an attack. That was the last time. <laughs> we both lied and said we had to go oh, to the bathroom, uh, and then we got caught and did nothing. It's like, why didn't you guys try and dodge that? Well, after all that time pretending we had to go to the bathroom, I actually have to go, I to, had the to go to the bathroom. <laughs> And, like, we couldn't go to the bathroom because they had led us to the only bathroom. And that was when we were still faking it. So I had to find a different bathroom. <laughs> so you can understand it's kind of like a whole thing. I know when it cleaned it for a while. I'm oh, not going to it there. gross. Yeah, it was like a gas station bathroom. I'm not going to fucks with that. <laughs> anyway, uh, I, anyway, I peed Gokuro's pants and told him it was him. And full circle. All right. <laughs> Kakuro, he's fucked up by the attack. He thinks to himself, oh, no, I can't move. Uh, I, no matter how much strength I, stri I try to muster, but I know they're also frozen to their spots. If we keep this up, we're finished. I have to say something, anything. Raw! No way. Uh, <laughs> everyone! Run away! Steal your mind and cast your fear aside and run away! <laughs> what a line. <laughs> what, like this fucking brave heart speech he starts giving in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> uh, and shadows cover his face and are blue looing off his eyes. He goes, I will protect everyone until the very end. Uh, yep. So he uh, manages to stand up. Uh, and the little four is just like, all right, I mean, I'm, I'm still planning on killing the others first, but whatever. Suo tries to do a thing, uh, and she, you know, she flash steps behind the spirit uh, to attack him. And she thinks, like, didn't you tell us, Yajima, that you could rely on us more? So if we're running away, we're going together. Right, Yajima? And uh, the level four spirit's like, okay, finger gun, and blows a hole in her side. Uh, uh -huh. And she... Yeah, so good job, Suo. You got you almost did a thing. Uh, so, uh, oh no, she's mortally I, wounded again. You you do have to remember she was topless for a while throughout the day. So it, <laughs> she's again emotional bandwidth was just spent. Uh, so yeah, oh no, she's gonna die. Except we clearly established that they have healing things so that she'll be fine. Uh, but then at that moment, he felt his blood being replaced with something else. And then Gakro gets a, a, another power thing, another surge of power. And he goes, <laughs> uh, and the level four goes, what an overwhelming aura. Interesting. Uh, and Gakro just grabs Karasu Tengu back. Uh, yep, just grabs it back. And uh, Karasu Tengu narrates for a little bit. Uh, and ba ba the important thing is that he got control of the cross Tengu back away from the level four spirit, which means the barrier's resilience is at 72%. It is not yet weak enough to be broken by merely anyone. <laughs> oh, Nui showed up. Thank goodness the character who is allowed to do things, uh, is here. So she's here to save everything. Yep. Yeah, I don't really know how to feel about this. I feel like we've already gone to this well before. This is how the last big action arc kind of also had a conclusion where it was like, oh, the cool member of Shiroha's family is going to come and rescue her. And then Nue was like, actually, what if I interfere? And it was like meant to be a thing that they were like, well, she can't actually influence things physically anymore. That was the consequence of that arc. Um, but she can. 
So I don't know. Maybe that, maybe maybe it's just a gigantic bluff. This is like a Haruma level bluff where she's like, I'm just going to show up and hope he doesn't realize I can't actually do anything and he's just going to scamper away. Uh, but if, if she is here to just save the day, it's it seems kind of boring. Yeah. Uh, it seems that this series is really starting to suffer from uh, having too many characters now that there are five important ones. So that could be a problem going forward uh, because... Again, the only things of note that Tsuo and Shiro have done in this entire mission are be embarrassed about their bikinis falling off. So embarrassed that they can't put them back on. So, yep. Glad they came along for all this. Yes, very, all very right. cool. Super satisfying. All right. Two on Ice, Chapter 23, Concept. Uh, so... Yes, uh, last time we were talking about how, hey, Sora is selecting a partner for pair skating and all that stuff. Meanwhile, Ayuma and Kisara are preparing as well. They establish at the beginning of this one, like, okay, look, you've got to figure out your short program and your free skate. The short program is first. It's basically your introduction to all of pair skating. If you've got a concept, if you've got a song you want to do, let's talk it out. Then... Uh, we cut over to Sora. He has selected his partner. It is Aya Himuro, the uh, short-haired girl that we saw with the big, big eyes uh, in the last chapter. And so they get mobbed by paparazzi immediately. Uh, and they're like, how do you feel? How do, what do you think of Mr. Sora? And stuff. And she's like, oh, uh, uh, I, I started figure skating because I wanted to be like a princess. And Mr. Sora has been like a, like a prince. Uh, so they're like, oh, so he's the prince who chose you. So that must make you Cinderella. Like, all right. You wanted to get that headline. All right. Yeah. Good, good for you, Mr. Reporter guy. Or Miss, Miss Reporter Lady. We don't see their face. Anyway. Um, they After they get away from them, uh, Sora is like, okay, I got to make some more media appearances and stuff like that. And it's clear that Himuro is just like completely awestruck in his presence. This obviously is not an even partnership she idolizes him and stuff and she starts to fantasize over because she's like oh my god she he picked me i actually really do feel like cinderella what if we have our happily ever after it's honestly the funniest part of the chapter is the fantasy sequence she comes up with it's all flowery and shoujo -y and stuff yeah uh I think his name is Mashiba, I want to say. The manager uh, for Sora, I want to say. Sure. Uh, yeah, so he meets up with, with Sora, and they talk about it a little bit. Uh, and uh, Sora mentions, like, yeah, I, I chose her because there's something I want to try. And she seemed the most likely to be excited about it. Okay. Uh, but then he also thinks about this whole Cinderella thing that has been going on. He's like, oh, that might be a good concept. I know the perfect song. But... Who cares about this girl that he actually picked? Quinn, trash girl, check in. Trash girl, trash girl. Oh, it's only like a page long, though. It's only a page. And I was like, but that means if they are checking in on her for one page, she'll be in future chapters. Theoretically, the, uh, no manga has ever introduced a character then to ceremoniously dump them off. Yeah, it's established that she didn't even make tryouts after auditioning, and she's like, God damn it, I quit my job. And <laughs> oh my god, honey, Jesus, no! <laughs> my, my room's been collecting trash, and I am literally a trash girl now. <laughs> this is uh, not me. I need to be very clear. Last week, I was like, I'm the trash girl. I want him to look at me and be, and be like, what a dirty fucking idiot loser you are. And I'm like, oh, yes, romance. <laughs> Quitting your job to chase that is the bad move, and then just sitting around trash. No. Uh, then she hears on the TV that like, oh yes, Takikisora has chosen his partner, and she's immediately like, I need to see it for myself. Uh oh, that could be trouble. <laughs> I hope. I don't know what this series is aiming to do, especially as we kind of flash forward uh, by the end of this chapter. Yeah, but I hope the next chapter is she walks in on her fucking knees with a fucking wig on. And she's like, it's me, your partner that you've always had. <laughs> uh, Kisara and Hayuma practice. Uh, they practice and they practice. Uh, and then Kisara also is like, hey, it looks like you're landing about half your triple axles and stuff. Uh, they're practicing their jump side by side, and it's just kind of like a quick re overview of their training regimen together and all the work they have to do. Uh, and time just passes. It's like, look, 
Timeline's got to be accelerated. We know, guys, I know that you wanted part two of this series to really take its time, but uh, this might be part two of two, so we got to get it going. <laughs> yeah, here. there there might be uh, single digit chapters left for this series at this mm. point, so. Uh, the Natsu twins come in and uh, they're like, okay, yeah, we, we, uh, there's, uh, we've been doing a lot of competitions and stuff, and now it's time for you guys' debut, uh, which is also going to be the debut of Aya Himuro and Takeyuki Sora as a pair. So you guys are going to debut at the same fucking event. No pressure, guys! <laughs> yeah, don't worry about it. Uh, but they're trying to keep their perspective. Hayuma says, like, look, we know that most of the audience is going to be there for Sora, and we're going to be in an, un an unfamiliar location. It's going to be a fight to see whether we can get them to watch us and whether they understand what we're trying to convey. So trying to keep the perspective and not have it be all about like oh you know we got to beat Sora and stuff it's just like we got to try and do our best here yes. we need to show the world who we are and show the world that there are pairs that are amazing that aren't talking to Sora that's our goal uh, and so the day approacheth uh, poor Himuro she's still just like he's so cool that's to all her thoughts on Sora he's so cool and handsome and great this dude's so uh, fucking awesome he talks about God and the devil. Oh, I was going to say this. To be fair, this is also my thoughts on Sora. This dude's so cool and awesome. He has all these great biblical references. <laughs> uh, and Sora is going to be skating ahead of them with Imoro. So it's like, well, great. They got to follow this. Uh, they pass by each other in the hallway. And the, then uh, Kisara says to Hayama, hey. Let's listen to the song together before we get on the rink. And she's got a pair of wired earbuds so they can listen to it together. Um, and we get a little bit of a flashback that's where they, to when they decided what the song was going to be and what they discussed, which was like, oh yeah, you know, before Kisara said, it's just the two of us on the ice. The most important thing is for us to face each other. I think we should choose a song where we won't forget that. Uh, and they're like, yeah, we're going to do this. I'm sure it'll be, be fine. It'll be just the two of us on the ice. I wonder if the song is just the two of us. It feels like it kind of is going to be. <laughs> what's the funniest song this could be? Um, hmm. Uh, is there a song called Two on Ice? <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. I'm trying to think. I was like, what are the best like songs about it? One is the loneliest number. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> All by myself. <laughs> I walk for miles inside this pit of danger. I walk alone. <laughs> oh, they should just skate to like WWE theme songs. <laughs> I'm an ass man. <laughs> bow, bow. <laughs> and then if we want a serious Austin answer, Billy and Chuck, you look so good to me. <laughs> right. Yeah, this is a <laughs> <answer>. <laughs> like, oh like after making suggestions, they were like, all right, so we, we're not going to do Randy Orton or, or Ass Man or anything, but for real, <laughs> Billy and Chuck, you look so good to me. It's kind of romantic. Right? <laughs> oh. oh my god. Toki Wakita. So, uh, yeah, um, Sora approaches Himura and is like, hey, let's get down to the rink together because uh, the next practice is starting. We do see that Trash Girl has shown up for this competition. She is in the audience and is getting ready to watch. Um, and uh, Sora and Himura come out onto the ice and uh, we get a you know kind of just like a reiteration of Sora's whole thing. I perceive in order to allow these untold and unforgivable desires to consume me to enjoy in full the temptations of such a fanciful world and I exist so that these alluring fallacies may overpower me. Uh, Kimura and Sora's pair program is from the ballet Cinderella Cinderella's Dance. Sure. I have started to make a, a, a habit of looking up these songs if they're going to perform them. Look this one up. Did not like it. <laughs> I was immediately like I cannot listen to this 90 second song. I'm bored. Oh my quickly. god. <laughs> That's fair though. But Bailey's not my thing. So, yeah. 
we got other stuff to talk about. We got a couple more chapters left. Uh, this was just kind of setting the stage, honestly. It's like, all right, it's the first time that they're going to be in a competition with Sora. Let's see how it goes. This hey, Luce? this did feel more like what people were trying to say with Green Green Greens, where I'm like, I do feel like this series knows that it's Absolutely. its time is up. So it's like, all right, let's move to that first competition, and then let's let's try to start like wrapping these plot lines up. Yeah. Which is, again, kind of weird why... Uh, we we spend a little bit introducing two new characters if one of them's there and then maybe i don't know maybe he doesn't like fucking cinderella girl at the end of this so he's like i don't know how about trash girl from the audience you should be my partner and then they do one that one sucks too and everyone's like actually maybe sora's the bad (laughs) (laughs) elusive samurai chapter 148 respect 1338 uh Tokyuki woke up surrounded by flower petals and stuff, and it turns out this is not, like, a thing going through the afterlife or anything. This is just, he woke up, and he's yes. alive. He is at Akie's mansion, where he's been recovering uh, for uh, a time, like, several days. Uh, he wakes up immediately. All of his attendants rush towards him and embrace him and stuff. He immediately is like, ow! My stomach got cut open. Why? Uh... And uh, so he's like, oh my god, I, I actually survived that Sasakyo attack. And uh, it, they established like, oh yeah, in that moment where Kojiro and Ayako were rushing in to defend him, they did manage to deflect the first downward strikes. So the cuts to the chest were diagonal, and then the horizontal cut that was supposed to finish you off completely missed. So that's why you survived. Uh, and uh, they do blame themselves for allowing him to get hurt, but Tokyuki's like, uh, don't worry about it. Uh, what happened then? And they're like, well, Suruga Shiro came to your rescue. You know, Suruga Shiro, whom we've definitely introduced and had a lot of fun times with before. Anyway, <laughs> uh, Akie ordered a retreat. They established, like, you know, how this is kind of affecting battle plans, where they are right now. None of this context really makes sense to me because I don't know anything about Japanese history or geography. Sorry. Uh, but uh, Akie also says that uh, he received a message from uh, Nita Yoshisada, which is, uh, we are in Echizen, and uh, aren't you coming to join me? Uh, but uh, Akira is like, no, how would we do that? We're, our army is exhausted. Tokyuki is, was critically injured and stuff. So they, they are not able to join up, which disappointed uh, Yoshisada, but he's like, oh, look, I'll stay with Nakasendai here. Uh, he's, you know, he's my age, he fights for his clan, I should stop relying on my father, too. So, yep, that's all happening. Uh, and then they're like, yeah, so, uh, we brought you here to recover. Uh, and Toki is like, well, oh, but, 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 Fubuki. And Nakia says, like, yes, he was your retainer and teacher. And Toki is like, yeah, and he's never going to return. And he's really upset about this because the guy he thinks is Fubuki has hurt him, meaning that he thinks that Fubuki's betrayed him different guy come on yeah come Uh, on guys we've been over this he starts to like you know like bundle up in the sheets and cry and ekie whips the sheets off of him and is like don't soil fine bedding with your filthy tears which is probably the actually funniest thing that i've seen him do uh Mm -hmm. in this series nick's turning around he's like actually ekie is pretty funny and cool when you think maybe maybe Uh, but he says, like, don't be so full of yourself. You looked up to your teacher, yet now you pity him with kindness. Never coddle your teachers. You must surpass them with steely determination. If I had a people who surpassed me, that would make me happy. And Toki realized, like, oh, I, I guess I have to do that. I have to surpass my teacher, the person who actually taught me, you know, swordplay and stuff. Uh, but Akie then, like, gets all embracey and touchy uh, and he says like but never lose that kindness in these troubled times it is beautiful and precious don't like a kie fuck him he's weird uh so he says that uh, they're going to depart in five days uh to su- secure supplies and stuff and of course they're like okay tokyo he needs freaking rest and stuff tokyo is like ah a kie respects me this is how he shows respect right uh they are traveling. Tokyuki's still not very well, so Ayaka's just, like, fully carrying him around, which is kind of cute. Um, they get to a place in Issei where they can, like, you know, have, like, freaking fish and stuff. There's also a cute moment where Sheena, like, dices up some food uh, with her finger blade things uh, yeah. so for Tokyuki to eat it. 
uh, and they say, this is so weird. So uh, they're like, you know, I, for whatever reason, I've been asleep for like three days, but I'm not hungry. And they're like, oh, yeah, well, Shizuku and Ayaka said you ate in your sleep. And Tokiki's like, oh, I used chopsticks while I was asleep? I must have been starving. And they're like, yeah, your body moved on its own. And your lips were so soft. So they, they fed, fed him, out. Nick. It's so out, cute. Out, out. So, yeah, yeah. Anyway. Everything, you're, you're changing your mind on everything. You're like, Akie wasn't so bad. I love this romance. Uh, Nick yeah, might be everything. ready to call this a series of the year. No, it's too early, guys. That's the only reason. That's the only reason. Uh, Tokiyuki makes up his mind like, okay, next time, I, look, I've got a best Fubuki, so I'll dodge his attack next time. Uh, and Kojiro is like, yeah, that's the, the spirit and all that. Uh, we'll we'll rend each other's flesh, spill each other's guts, and hash it out with him. And then there's a weird moment where Shizuku says, like, that's sexist, Kojiro. In the future, both men and women hash things out by rending each other's flesh and spilling each other's guts. What the fuck are you talking about, Shizuku? What are you talking about? What does that have anything to do with anything? Anyway, uh, then uh, Tokiki's like, oh, do you think Natsu would like one of these lobsters? Where is she? And Genba says, oh, yeah. Uh, she switched sides to join Konomura. So I was like, oh, the betrayal happened. She went back to the forces. But there's a twist. Because Genba says... I saw through that serious girl's behavior, and I've set a scheme in motion against Mora now. And I'm actually legitimately, like, actually really intrigued by this, because this could mean multiple things. Like, is this a manipulation by Genba? Like, he knew that she was playing him, and so she he fed her, like, false information or something like that? Or is this he confronted her over it and convinced her to instead be a double agent for their services? Like, yeah, there's a be... couple of different directions this could go. It... As we've said before, the elusive samurai is at its best when it's actually focusing on the elusive warriors. So the idea of like, hey, uh, let's see what Gemba and Natsu have in their relationship and let's start, you know, processing that is going to be more interesting than being like, all right, here's where the next historical battle took place. Uh, let's, you know, put some some historical figures here, give them silly little gimmicks. Perhaps this one stands upside down and their their uh, head gets so hot it boils out all the water in this pool. Oh, That's no. That's ridiculous, Quinn. No character would ever do that. <laughs> it's certainly not the best swordsman in the galaxy that has to be overcome. <laughs> all right. Akane Banashi. This is what we're finishing on, by the way, because uh, there's no yes, one piece. There's just one so. piece. Uh, Akane Banashi Story 101. Exactly. Uh, so Akane is in her story, uh, Tanuki Dice. She has been doing a lot of improv by connecting it to other various stories, which is starting to cause a problem because they're worried that she's going to overrun her segment and ruin the show. Uh, and so she starts getting towards the climax of the story where the gambler has the Tanuki Die and he's getting people set up and he's kind of being accused because this thing's been transforming and stuff. Uh, is tampering with it but he's like come on I'll, I'll you know i'll put the cup i'll put it under a cup so you know that i'm not messing with it and then you guys place your bets and let's get into it and they're like we know that there's something up with that die it's been sliding across the ground it turned into a bunch of stuff so it seems like you're up to no good and uh, you know the gambler is like there's nothing on my sleeve no trickery that is exactly what someone who was using trickery would say of course uh but akane is like this is so great i can just keep going. The audience is going along with me this whole time. I'm having so much fun. And there's a visual of her as a little kid. And she is you know, stacking up Jenga pieces and she's like, I can just keep it going higher and higher and higher, stacking up my Nen. And uh, so everyone's starting to worry about how she's only got like 90 seconds for her allotted time slot. What should I do next? What should I do? I can keep on going more and more. And then all of a sudden there's a Achoo! In the audience. And it's her father. And Akane recognizes it. And within that internal vision of herself stacking stuff up, her father appears and just kind of puts a hand on her, sh her shoulder. And Akane realizes, oh, right, I'm here because of Asagao. And so she instead goes into 
kind of actually following the beats of the story. And so you said, all right, you know, let's wrap this up. I'll, 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 I won't even touch the cup. I won't mess with it. So everyone, place your bets. And everyone realized, like, she's back on track. She's gotten where she's supposed to be at this point. Uh, there's a little conversation between her parents and the audience. Her mother says, that's what you get for walking outside in the cold. <laughs> so, But her father thinks back to when Akane would, you know, play Rock Go by herself in her room. And apparently, when she was hatching these ideas, you know, when she has that moment of like, ah, oh, you bump on a log, and she had that breakthrough kind of moment, her dad was listening to her. Yeah. Uh, and he thinks to himself in this moment, I'm sure that whether that whole incident had happened or not, Akane would still have turned out to be a Rakugoka, but without meaning to. And he remembers coming back to home one day and seeing her practicing Jugemu going over the name, reciting it over and over. And he thinks, I've added a new burden to her trip down that path. When I already knew best what kind of suffering would be involved. It's not an easy path by any means. And I know it's not my place to speak for her. But still, just how it was for me back then, I hope that Akane is able to have more. And uh, we get into the story. And uh, everyone's placed their bets, and and it's okay. If I can make the little Tanuki be a five, which is the one thing that nobody gambled on, then I can make it happen. And so, uh, he start a guy starts to say like, "Okay, here we go." And one of the one of the gamblers says, "No, no, no, hold on. I don't trust you. Don't even say anything. And then we'll reveal the die." But then the gambler gets an idea of like, "Wait, wait, wait, wait. Okay, if I can't say the number." I can at least pray to God first, right? And so she prays to Tenjin God of the Plumflower Crest, which is the same crest that was compared to the five on the die before. Uh, do you hear me? My favorite god of all, Tenjin. I only want to see Tenjin. And lifts the cup up. And the story goes, when the cup came off the ground, what they found was a little tanuki dressed up like the god Tenjin. Waka waka! That's the end of the story. Tanuki dies. Big laugh at the end. Everyone is applauding. Akane bows, and she has ended the story right on time. Yep. And good for her. Everyone's happy with this. And then Tenjin at all. is off on the side. Hmm? Tenjin is off on the side. He's he's uh, she's gonna run right into him after this. Oh uh, yes, that is true. Tyson. 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 Sorry. He's watching from directly off stage, yes. Uh, but he's also... I think he's next, him. yeah. So. yeah. Uh, Akane's mother spots something's going on with her hubby, and she says, what's the matter? That story was just all fun from start to finish. And Akane's dad is wiping tears from his eyes, and he says, exactly. Aww. Good for them. They're having good family moments. Yeah, that is Akane Banashi for this week. It was fun. It was a nice little story. I like the, we brought things full circle, you know, a hundred, hundred chapters ago, Akane making a little noise in the audience made uh, her dad uh, come back to himself and put on a big performance. And in this moment, he manages to reach his daughter the same way. Yeah. Seemingly, maybe a little bit more intentionally. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, um, this was nice. And uh, it was nice to have this full closure on like this father-daughter relationship be come to play in the actual performance yeah that's a good chapter it was a good week there's a lot of manga i think that a are worthy chapters. of chapter of the week but which one will it be which indeed do you have one picked out who this is a tough one i'm trying to go through I them all one. okay you you can go ahead first uh, there was a lot of really good stuff this week, uh, but I am going with Green Green Greens. Uh, it's such a satisfying chapter to see Haku putting it all together in this moment. The Just that great moment of building self-confidence where he's like, I don't want to just mimic other people. The ideal I want in this moment is myself. It's, it's so satisfying, even more than just the fact that it works out and he sinks the birdie, yeah. uh, is, is that that's the big breakthrough. Yeah, I will agree with you. I think Green Green Greens is probably the one I enjoyed the most. I really, really liked Blue Box. My Hero was really good. Uh, Under mm -hmm. the Luck. I re Chainsaw Man was funny. Like, pretty much every series, with the exception of New Sex Assistant and Zero, was pretty good this week. Uh, so, uh, good stuff. Um, 
And uh, God, for favorite character, I, I have I guess... my favorite character, so I'll do that one. Go um, ahead. I'm gonna say this is a weird one to do because this character is not actually like in the chapter, but this chapter of my hero really did make me like Deku a lot. And, like, hmm. really connect with his uh, struggle here and everything he's done throughout the course of the series. So it, it is sort of strange. He doesn't have really much of any lines of any kind in this chapter. Um, but I think the presence of him and how it is built up in this chapter and how people react to him uh, was really significant and did catch me. Uh, I'm trying to remember his non Rakugo title. Hang on a second. Because it's not Shinta. It's, oh, Toru. Uh, Toru. 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 Osaki. I'm going to go with him. Okay. Uh, I, I just really like that interjection that he has uh, into Akane's Jenga building thing where he kind of brings her back to her senses. It's a great little visual metaphor. But there was a lot of stuff that happened this week uh, that, was, that was really good. I liked the stuff happening with Soul in yes. Undead Unluck. Uh, I really liked the Haryu's looking back on his time with uh, with Taiki and how his thoughts on him have evolved. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I, I, I liked a lot of stuff this week. Uh, very, very good ratio of good to bad uh, this week. Yes. Uh, the, the audience, by the way, picked Akane Banashi as their chapter of the week. And uh, the Gilly Guillotine Devil is again. I'm not going to try to say that nickname. I, I don't think it is fit for the English uh, tongue. Um, yeah, yeah I, I could pronounce it Gil Gilly, but that's not how you say Gilly, guillotine. Not correct. Gee, yeah, yeah, Gee. No, awful. So Gee. Guillotine Devil. Uh, yeah. All right, that is going to do it for Week of Manga Recap this week. Everybody, we will be back. Next time, same manga channel, same manga time. On Wednesday, we tend to record the show 7.30 Eastern here on twitch.tv slash T. You can also check us out on Podbean. We can find greekup.podbean.com is where all of the audio episodes are stored. You can find them on whatever podcast feed you like, Spotify, iTunes, the whole shebang. Video versions are on, week, on youtube.com slash weekly manga recap. We also have title cards done for us occasionally by Steve Mann, whose artwork you can find by looking for Steve Mann Art online. And there's an opening sequence for each and every single episode by Milo Jack Stillitz and Winsley Dell Shutter, which is very great and cool. Thank you guys yes. for that. There is also a Discord, which is linked wherever this show gets posted. Join that Discord to stay up to date on when the show is going live, when stuff gets posted. Uh, discuss chapters as they come out, make recommendations for future stuff for us to check out by posting them onto the Weekly Manga Recap Google Doc, which is maintained by Ninja X3i. And if you want to even more Weekly Manga Recap stuff, we post monthly bonus episodes on Patreon, patreon.com slash Weekly Manga Recap, if you want to support the show financially as well. Yes. So, uh, please, uh, please do listen to the newest one, by the way. My house was destroyed. Uh, well, it was being recorded, so... Um, yeah, and, um... Okay, so, uh... Guys, there has been a kind of a gaping hole in the, uh, stuff that we have covered uh, in the course of the show. Uh, there was one that we filled in right at the start of the year, uh, and now we're going to do something else, which is we're gonna... Look at Dragon Ball. Uh, it's going to be an undertaking, but you know what? Well, th uh, let's let's be clear about something. Are we covering Dragon Ball through Dragon Ball Z? Because there is a very firm could, break. That's a pretty convenient break, honestly. <laughs> Hang on, how much is that? Hang on, let me I, look it up. On... If I recall, it's still a couple, like, hundred chapters it is for, for Dragon chapters. Ball, but I know I... I know I have not touched the Dragon Ball Z side of things, and I was able to get through Dragon Ball in, like, like a couple weeks. Uh, I think we might just cover OG Dragon Ball. Okay. And maybe do Dragon Ball Z later. Uh, yeah. So, that's gonna do it for now, everybody. We will be back next week with more Manga Good Times. So, we all have a good one. Yeah, Manga Good Times. That's different from Manga Bad Times. Uh, one would think, yes. Uh-huh. This is just logic. We're putting together. Look at us. We're using our big brains, our big sexy brains. 
Yeah, even though during the good times, apparently we're still covering bad stuff, though, so I guess it's not that different. So. <laughs> we just talked about a manga we love today, and we talked about a bunch of great chapters of manga. You can't let Eden Zero paint and your entire... And <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everybody.